Somebody commented that my new haircut makes me look like Raziel from Legacy of Kane, and I am not about to argue against that. Welcome back, everyone, as I torture myself with the worst books around. Continuing now down the Twilight Pipeline, yet, yet again with 365 Days, written by Polish author Blanka Lipinska. Sorry in advance if I'm mispronouncing that name or any other words in this book. It is well established that I cannot pronounce foreign words, which is part of the reason why I haven't bothered reviewing Les Miserables. That one was on purpose. Could have been. 365 Days is the controversial tome about a woman who gets kidnapped and loves it. 365 Days is one of those stories that gets a lot of attention because of how much people hate it. Very much like Twilight was back in the day, but where people actually understood what Twilight was to an extent, 365 Days is something where people seem to hear the premise and then turn it off. This story is about a Polish woman named Laura who goes on vacation in Sicily runs into the head of a mob family who wants to have her and almost immediately kidnaps her. He then gives her 365 days to fall in love with him and if she doesn't then he'll let her go, which is not a weird premise at all. But it would be kind of tedious for me to really critique the story on the premise considering that this is just porn. 365 Days is supposed to be this really intense uh, erotica, and it's not the worst I've, I've seen. I actually think that it does a better job in a number of aspects than The Mister, and it also does things a lot worse than The Mister. For example, one of the complaints I had about The Mister was this large gap right here where it was completely absent of any real sex scenes or sexual tension, and you can see 365 Days does a much better job uh, paying attention to what it is. But it also does a lot of things a lot worse because while the Mister was a tepid erotica, this one is known as, it, it falls into the genre of dark romance. Now dark romance is a very broad, kind of ill-defined genre. It's really a romance with darker themes. So instead of going out for coffee and uh, skipping stones at the beach or whatever, uh, it's about a woman who gets kidnapped uh, or sold into slavery. This is a common idea in a lot of these books, and there's, there's a lot more than just this that does that. I, I came across a, a number of titles that have very similar premises, and unlike your common romance, Dark romance oftentimes goes after very sexual themes. So while a common romance would be about holding hands, dark romance is about getting tied to the bed and whipped. As ill-defined as it is, dark romance is also known by a number of different names. There's also dark erotica, I've heard mafia romance, and also captive captor romance. They're all basically about the same thing. The fundamental theme that seems to be at play comes down to power dynamics. The genre is usually driven by massive differences in power dynamics, for example, powerful men versus weak or scared women. There's an appeal to the power the men display, and some women are apparently attracted to that. I can see this working if handled correctly. Now, I personally find the genre icky, but I'm not about to start complaining about what effectively amounts to fantasy. As long as you're not emulating the events in these books, in real life, then it becomes a whatever issue. Besides, let's be honest, anytime mainstream porn attempts to have any kind of a story, it's nonsensical. We do have a couple lemon whores in this in this community. That's Those sneaking. damn lemon stealing whores. My emotional support cat is here to stop me from going mad. You were also an hour too early for lunch. You have to wait, you fuzzball. Blah. Blah. Careful, careful. It's a new shirt. I forgot what I was talking about. Sometimes anytime porn or erotica attempts to have a story, there requires almost an absurd amount of suspension of disbelief. Do I need to say anything beyond Bible Black or LA Blue Girl? But you accept those because it's all part of the fantasy. So if you like this book for purely fantasy reasons, fine. I've got nothing that I can really say to you. If you like this 
because it's a good story, oh, you're in trouble. The other aspect of dark romance that I am not really a fan of comes down to the aspect of consent. And in stories like this, the idea of consent is pushed into, eh, let's worry about that later. But that's not to say that captive romance cannot be done correctly. For example, one of my go-to examples of the genre is a beloved classic that just about everyone who's seen it completely adores. Kiss, kiss for love. How many of you thought I was going to say Beauty and the Beast? While Beauty and the Beast has several aspects of captive romance done correctly, with origins going back to the 1700s, Orin High School Host Club takes the power dynamics that dark romance relies on, but mixes it with a light-hearted comedic air. And if you've never seen the anime, which you should totally watch, it's one of the funniest I can name, it takes place in an absurdly wealthy high school. Now, the story follows a commoner student named Haruhi who won a scholarship to attend the school. At one point, she's looking for, I believe it was a place to just sit down and study quietly, and ends up running into the club room of the Oren High School Host Club. The Host Club is a group of pretty boys that women can sit down with, have tea with, uh, just chat about their days. Well, Haruhi ends up accidentally bumping into an extremely expensive vase, smashes it, and now she owes the host club money for that vase. But because she's a commoner, she doesn't have the money to actually pay them back, so she's got to work it off. And a lot of the comedy comes down to Haruhi is actually a woman, but everyone mistook her for a guy. So what they do is they have her dressed up as a guy to get cl uh, female clients in the host club in order to get money back in order to pay them for the vase. And as the series go on, they, they have all sorts of character interactions and uh, everyone grows, grows closer to her, including the club president, uh, Tamaki. But you've still got a lot of the right elements there. There's a power difference. There's the uh, kind of overbearing male love interest in Tamaki, the stubborn and strong-willed female protagonist in Haruhi, which is not something I can say about this monstrosity. Now, like I said, this is further down the Twilight pipeline. And what I mean by that is, you started with Twilight, which inspired Fifty Shades of Grey, and the author has stated that the inspiration for this book was a combination of Fifty Shades of Grey, as well as her own trip to Sicily at one point. Somehow, every new entry down the Twilight Pipeline just gets worse than the previous one. If we get a novel inspired by 365 days, it's probably going to be about a woman who falls in love with an incel who spends all day sucking on her feet. This book is terrible and not the fun kind of terrible. I really thought I'd already reached the darkest of the dark. What the hell are you mumbling about now? But then, ahead of me... beheld a darkness even greater still. Now, Lipinska has stated that this book is semi-autobiographical, although she hasn't been entirely clear on what aspects are really true and which ones are entirely fictitious. She claims that she was kidnapped in Sicily at one point for a little while, and that's about it. Also, the character of Martin is inspired by an ex of hers, and if that's the case, seems kind of cruel the way that she refers to him in the book, but we'll get to that in a bit. I also don't really understand, like, how true the kidnapping aspect could have been, because if that's the case, then she's treating an otherwise traumatic event very favorably, to the point where she wrote an entire romance trilogy around it. I mean, if that's a coping mechanism, then hey, bravo, more power to you. But it seems to play things off a little too favorably. And we're far enough into the video that I think I can say this without the YouTube moderators going crazy and canceling all the monetization on this video, which is going to be a challenge in and of itself. So it's as safe time as any to put up this warning label. This is the kind of book where it's okay to use an unconventional bookmark, like ketchup or peanut butter, 
This is the story of Christian Grey's evil brother. It is a story about a Mafia Don and his free-range girlfriend. This story attempts to take the bad boy archetype to dangerous new lows. This book asks, how can we make human trafficking sexy? This book is like Kaguya-sama Love is War, but without the fun. I want to say that I'm confused by the financial success of this book in Fifty Shades of Grey, but apparently those authors know how to corner a market. Mm, trash. Yeah, I love trash. Yum, yum, trash. This is a sort of messed up book that really appeals to a subset of weirdos. Yes. <laughs> yes! Oh, wait, no. Slight correction. Because this book takes place in Europe. We. <laughs> Now, I do need to put a bit of warning out there beforehand, uh, in addition to the general content warning out there. Sex scenes with power dynamics with strong, demanding men and gentle, willing women can really work. But this isn't what we get in this story. The central issue is that we're given one image, but we're told it's supposed to mean something else. We're given abuse, and we're told that it's sexy. We're given assault, and told that it's romantic. I don't think anyone out there is really dumb enough to believe what this book is saying outside of a very niche minority who already likes this sort of garbage, but to see it held in, uh, on a pedestal like what Netflix is trying to do just annoys me. Now, we're not really going to be talking about the sex scenes in too much depth. If you think about them like in a vacuum devoid of surrounding context, they are at best passable which is better than anything that I can say about the mister. If you include context, the whole thing is really mm. squicky. A lot of this book is uncomfortable and not just because it's badly written, but one thing that I do need to say up front is because this is a translation, I have to give some degree of leniency to the author. Uh, particular phrases might not be her fault. It could just be a mistranslation. But we do get plenty of lines that I'll be covering that just sound weird. And as we go along, we'll see that the translator or the author eventually got really tired or bored and they just wanted to finish up. Like the last couple of chapters are so weirdly rushed. I'm not sure whose fault it was. But considering the number of Polish fans that I've said who say, who have expressed concern that Poland is known for this book, keep in mind, Poland also gave us The Witcher, so they're not completely hopeless. And I'm probably going to have to be creative with how I read some of these sections. Like, I, I want to give you guys full context for why this book is terrible, but there are going to be some sections that I'm just going to have to cut or jump around because otherwise I'm gonna have to read this like Mrs. Puff. He then approached Laura and blankety blankety blank. Also these aren't the only sex scenes they're just the only ones that are given with any real detail because there are plenty of times where you get a scene that the only description is they drove off to the side of the road and <laughs> but that is enough build up let us... I should be wearing gloves. This is the disaster piece of 365 days. So the book doesn't start off terribly. We get a scene with Massimo, uh, the head of the Sicilian crime family. Now, when I say it doesn't start off terribly, I'm speaking literally of the first three or four paragraphs because this is the one of the choppiest introductions to any story I can think of. Do you know what this means, Massimo? I turned my head toward the window, looking at the cloudless sky, and then fixed the man with a stare. I'll take over that company, whether the Menen uh, Menentes like it or not. And there's a degree of character here as Massimo is, is concluding some sort of business deal. We don't really get any details to what it is. Uh, eventually leading up to uh, him going to, uh, hopping on his private plane. The problem is you get a chunk of a scene and then a chunk of a scene and then a chunk of a scene. It's like the author is trying to rush through this as quickly as possible in order to get to the first sex scene, which is not a good one. We also get a very rushed introduction as Massimo gives us his motivation and backstory. He gets a text from a woman named Anna who I 
don't really want to call it girlfriend because there's no emotional attachment between the two of them because Massimo is fixated on a completely different woman. There she was again. My cock instantly grew hard as steel. God, I'll go crazy if I don't find her. It had been five years since the accident. Five long years since the, how did the doctor put it? The miracle of death and resurrection. Five years of dreaming about a woman I had never seen in real life. I had met her in my comatose visions. I could almost smell her hair, feel the smoothness of her skin. I could almost feel it. Each time I made love to Anna or any other woman, I made love to her. I named her my mistress. She was my curse, my obsession, and apparently my salvation. The backstory, as he explains later on, is he gets he got shot as part of a mob dealing meeting gone wrong and started envisioning uh, the woman who we eventually meet, Laura. And he makes it a mission in life to try to find her because he's sure they're destined to be together or some such nonsense. But because of the text from Anna, he is in a mood and uh, needs to relieve some frustration. So he grabs the stewardess on the private plane. And this is where we're putting the first content warning. Now, character introductions are crucial because they paint how we're going to view the character later on in the story. And it's not just the choices the character makes, it's also the interaction with other people around that character that paint how we, the reader, will see that character. And this is one of the worst character introductions I can list. Because this introductory sex scene, which begins on page three, is a less than willing one. It's weird. The book isn't really consistent with how it portrays the scene because the woman is wanting in some moments, but really not wanting in others. But I feel pretty confident in declaring that this is not a good moment. Massimo is a mob boss. He does bad things. I can accept that as an introduction. I can accept that as a character. But there's a line in how far you should be going with that character because there are certain points where a majority of your readers are not going to be willing to see him in any good light, despite whatever defense he puts up later on. If you've got a character who starts a story, they're lazy and kind of a slob, you can still root for that character because they can recognize what they're doing is wrong and eventually try to grow from that. If you've got a character who lives as a thief, well, Maybe there are conditions in their life that necessitate that. Their, their situation or society is so decrepit that it's the only way they can make money. It's not a good quality, but it's, with context, possibly forgivable. Compare that to if you have a teenager beating a puppy to death. Not for any particular reason. He wasn't being attacked. He was just bored. Are you going to like that character? Are you gonna root for that character's happiness? I doubt it. And that's how I feel about Massimo in the start of the book. This guy was so aggravating to me. With just this one introduction, by page five, I had altered his name in my notes to just ass. I just referred to him as ass. Because that's all he amounts to. This character is ass. Couple that with the fact that the stewardess is clearly not having a good time. She's like crying and clawing at his legs. Not a comfortable moment. And at no point does he ever atone or feel regret for this particular activity. He actually kind of defends it later on when he states that he was just up, you know, like raised in a world of violence. So that's what he understands. That doesn't excuse what you're doing. That doesn't make what you're doing okay or right in a new perception. It's evil, and I think you're evil. And the fact that he doesn't show any regret or attempts to atone for his actions means he's both uh, evil and reprehensible. And the driving drama of this story is him finding happiness via romance. 
I don't want him to be happy. I want him to go to jail. I had a similar reaction to Mark Lawrence's Prince of Thorns when on page three, the teenage punk leading a group of bandits is robbing a farmhouse. They don't find any treasure or anything of worth. So he suggests to his men that they go sniff out uh, to see if the farmer has any daughters. And I hated this book. Apparently this one was up for some awards or something. I might break this one down again. It is, it was exceedingly tedious. Anyway, after that scene, we get one of the most awkward, unnecessary exposition dumps that I've seen in a while. The expositional dialogue uh, is sometimes excusable, sometimes inevitable, but I've never seen it presented so blunt force trauma like this. I returned to my companions and sat, taking a sip of the exquisite liquor, though its temperature uh, had ceased to be perfect some time before. Mario put down his newspaper and sent me a look. Back in your father's day, they'd shoot us all dead. I sighed, rolling my eyes, and clinked the glass against the tabletop with irritation. Back in my father's day, we used to bootleg booze and drugs instead of running the biggest companies in Europe. I leaned back in my chair, pinning my consigliere with an angry stare. I am the head of the Tortellini family, and I got where I am by no quirk of fate. It was my father's decision. I have been brought up prepared to lead the family and bring it to, uh, into a new era. I sighed again, relaxing a little when the flight attendant flitted silently to the front of the plane. Mario, I said, I know you used to like shooting. The older man, my advisor, allowed himself a slight smile. There are ways around this. There are ways that you can explain things to the audience. But having characters explain things to other characters who already know those things, you might as well start off with, as you well know, if I were in that situation and I didn't have a choice, I would just have the exposition done via prose instead of dialogue, because you can at least explain it away without it looking awkward. The scene continues to rush by at breakneck speed when, on the same page as the exposition dump, Massimo runs in, uh, finally discovers Laura. Information runs by so quickly and so unnaturally that there are elements that I actually missed initially. For example, Massimo has his assistant following him around all the time uh, named Domenico. Domenico is actually his younger brother. And this is real to Laura in a kind of, oh my God, why didn't you tell me this sort of a revelation much later in the book? But because things are being thrown at me so quickly, I had somehow glossed over that little tidbit. You've got to be careful with how much information you throw at your reader at, at the start. If it's way too much, like what this book is doing, they're not going to be able to retain everything, and you're not going to be able to really display the world in any kind of a meaningful way. Like, I'm on page six. We have gotten uh, three or four different scenes by this place with the uh, starting meeting, and then getting in a car, and then getting in the private plane, and then landing, and then uh, talking in a club, it's way too much, way too fast. But Massimo has discovered the woman of his dreams that he somehow saw while he was comatose and orders his men to get information about her. And they have one hour to get anything about her. And in one hour, they get something about her. It's the, the first chapter is like this. It's, it's done so stupidly fast. And he discovers at long last that her name is Laura Beale. Beale with it! And going back to character introductions, rather than think about uh, wooing Laura or impressing her with his, his wealth or his good looks or anything, Massimo's immediate reaction is, I'll kidnap her. There was no hesitation in my voice. All right, I caught it. Now it's mine and I can force it to do whatever I want. <laughs> and then continuing the breakneck speed of everything, on the same page that he decides to kidnap Laura, Anna shows up and there is another sex scene. I am on page eight. And while I can appreciate the copious sex scenes, this is an erotica after all, that's kind of the point of the story. The only details, the only time the book actually takes its time in explaining anything is during the sex scenes. So this entire book up to this point feels like Lipinska, uh, Lipinska 
is rushing through everything just to get to the sex scenes at the detriment of the story. All of this setup, all of this character work is effectively moot, which is going to have terrible implications for later in the story when we're supposed to understand more about who Massimo is or how he thinks, which we understand who he is thus far. He's a terrible person and any justification later on is going to be kind of pointless. It's like, why even have the background information here if you're not going to give it any weight? And yes, I can appreciate that this is a dark romance, so Massimo being a terrible person isn't supposed to be this big shock or anything. The problem is, the world building is so slapdash and has so little definition at this point, I'm not sure what room they're in right now. We've had six or seven different place settings up to page 10, and I'd say a good four pages of that are detailed sex scenes. So this weird accordion effect of back and forth, back and forth on how much detail we're getting is really disjointed and really sends a conflicting image on how you're supposed to be reading this. Fortunately, Massimo doesn't really get a lot of point of view chapters. It's almost entirely Laura for the rest of the book. If it weren't for the fact that it establishes character, I would say that this first chapter is kind of pointless. So Massimo is with his usual lay slash girlfriend slash whatever, uh, Anna, who likes it rough. And we get all sorts of really domineering moments and the line, her ass was purpling. It's a light purple, which incidentally you cannot do. Just because you keep saying that doesn't make it a thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. Neither do I. And then it shifts to eight hours earlier and Laura's perspective. Thank God, because she at least has some redeeming qualities. Although the quality of writing hasn't gotten any better. The sound of the alarm clock pierced my brain. Get up, honey. It's nine already. We have to be at the airport in an hour. Our Sicilian adventure awaits. Let's go, Tybalt. Great adventures await. Now, in a lot of the clunky ways that we got information about Massimo, we get clunky information about Laura. I open my eyes slowly, reluctantly. It's the middle of the night for me, for God's sake. What a barbaric idea to fly at this time, I thought. Since I'd left work a few weeks ago, time of day stopped making any sense. I would go to sleep too late, wake up too late, and the worst of it was that I didn't have to do anything. I could do what I wanted. I'd spent too much time in the quagmire of the hotel business, and when I had finally gotten my dream position as a sales manager, I quit. I just lost the, the passion for my work. I never thought that at my age of 29 I'd feel burned out, but those were the facts. Now this is all information that colors in who Laura is and how we see her, and it fills in some information about like why her job doesn't notice she's missing after she's kidnapped because she doesn't have one. But there are so many better ways to fill in that information loosely like throughout the rest of her intro. You don't need to bash the reader over the head with uh, like some subset of information about who she is. Slowly let us know who she is. Sprinkle in that information a little bit at a time. Although I find it weird that her dream job was as a sales manager for a hotel, but whatever the information's there. We also get to meet Laura's boyfriend, Martin. Now remember that Martin is supposedly based on uh, the author's real life ex, and I feel like she was trying to work out some aggravation in real life when she was writing this book, which might be why we get some contradicting information about who Martin is as a person. For example, the first bit of insight that Laura gives us about him is, he was the best human being I'd ever met. He had his own company and each time he scored a big hit, he'd transfer a large sum to a children's hospice. He liked to say, I need to share God's blessing with others. Okay, he seems like a pretty nice, selfless person. Keep that in mind. We're going to be coming back to it. He's also apparently built very similar to uh, Lipinska's Limpitz ex. I'm going to keep messing that up. Uh, in that he's bald-headed and has blue eyes. There's absolutely something to be said about including people you know in your stories. The, the, the old joke being, don't annoy the writer, they'll put you in a book and kill you. 
It just feels a little insulting when Laura is going to describe Martin, who is based on a real person, like this. Our relationship wasn't your run-of-the-mill affair. We were both strong dominant types and were prone to explosive outbursts. We were also both intelligent and had significant knowledge of our respective professions. It pulled us both to each other, intriguing and impressing us. The only thing our relationship was lacking was the animal magnetism, the unbridled attraction and passion that had simply never been there. As Martin had once said, he'd already had his share of fucking. I, on the other hand, was a volcano of sexual energy threatening to explode at any time. I had to search for release by Master Bait, along with Apprentice Bait and Journeyman Bait, are based on the three ranks of craft guilds. On a daily basis, but still, I felt good at Martin's side, safe and calm. It was more important than sex, or at least that's what I thought. Now, I'm fine with this as a problem in the relationship. The issue is that the way that this is written so far, you might as well hold up a sign that says this is what's going to drive Laura to Massimo. Anyway, they get ready to go on a flight and Laura reveals that she doesn't like flying because she has claustrophobia, which will never actually manifest in the story outside of airplanes. And they're going to Sicily in Italy for some reason, despite the fact that Laura apparently doesn't like Italians. Last time I had been to Italy, I was 16. And since then, I didn't have a high opinion of Italians. They were noisy, intrusive, and didn't know a word of English. And English was like a native tongue to me. And this is a point that gets reinforced continuously throughout the story. Laura doesn't like Italians, and I don't know why. Sure, she lists a few reasons, but like, what's the backstory behind that? I mean, outside of some weird stereotyping that Poland doesn't like Italy, which I have no idea is the case. I don't even know what the hate for Italy is. Italy sounds like a great place. It's given the world a lot of fantastic things. Spaghetti, pizza, famous plumbers, Dante Alighieri, Final Fantasy VII porn in an actual Senate meeting, and most importantly, the woman who does the art for the thumbnails in some of my videos. Her screen name is Sylvie Chan. There's a link in the description to some of her work. The trip to Italy works out just fine. Laura and Martin meet up with their friends Michael and Carolina, and they go out to a nice little restaurant that is apparently dorned in exclusively white material. So white walls, white tablecloths, white artwork, I guess. And Laura's wearing a black outfit, which makes her stand out like a black beacon. I think it would have made more sense if she said she stood out like a black spot, but whatever. It's one of those moments where I'm not sure who's at fault there, the author or the translator. Generally speaking, I think you should do what you can to capture the original story as closely as possible. Trying to throw in your own interpretation is a really scummy thing to do, because at that point you're changing the author's original story in place of the one that you'd rather tell. But sometimes the wording is really weird. Uh, continuing the thought that she feels like she's standing out, Laura says this. I'm feeling watched, but who could have known we'd end up in a big milk jug? I whispered to Martin. I get that that's a comment on how white the room is, but that sounds so weird. Look, imagery in a book, in any book, is important. It should be creative, it should be distinct, but it must make sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, if you get a line like this milk jug thing, it gets the reader to pause and think, What the hell is going on? I mean, what the hell is going on? And during the whole time, Laura is sulking and kind of being off-putting. She's not being outwardly aggressive, really, but because the story is told from first-person perspective, from her point of view, we get her inner thoughts, and she's being kind of mean about things. Like this moment where they're looking over the menu in the restaurant. The waiter, despite being a Sicilian, was also an Italian, which meant we couldn't expect anything done fast. We'd have to wait a good long while before he came back to take our order. I've heard a few stereotypes about Italians, about how they talk with their hands a lot, but I've never heard them being slow. Is that a thing? Laura gets up from the table and excuses herself to go to the restroom when she bumps into 
Massimo, who has already started stalking her. Laura says that there was something in him that terrified her, and she froze. She was lightheaded, bewildered, and couldn't speak. In fact, Laura was so bewildered by the encounter that she just went back to the table and apparently completely forgot why she left in the first place. She downs the glass of Prosecco that was waiting for her in one gulp and just says that she needed a drink. To which Martin replies, That restroom has to be a magical place if that's the way it worked on you. She's reminded that it is now after midnight, which means that it is actually Laura's birthday which she doesn't like because reminding me of my age isn't too polite. Laura then snaps at Martin, which she says, by way of apology, I've ordered your favorite drink, which is a bottle of Moet and Chandon Rosé. I certainly said that wrong and I don't care. Laura then jumps up and squeal, like claps her hands and squeals like a little girl, which highlights a core problem with her initial design. Laura, as we'll see throughout the text, is both very materialistic and an alcoholic. Now, that's not a bad set to really start a character with and move them from there. The problem is the materialism, you know, her appreciation for really ritzy rich stuff, is a lot of the driving force attracting her to Massimo. And the book does not handle it in a healthy way. But because she forgot before, she gets up to go to the restroom again. And as she's walking through the restaurant, she sees Massimo again, who is staring at her. His jaw was covered with a meticulously trimmed dark stubble. His lips were full and well-defined, perfectly suited to pleasure a woman. I'm kind of offended by his lips. Am I allowed to be offended by his lips? Laura and her friends spend the rest of the evening going around uh, various clubs and drinking and the next morning she wakes with a terrible hangover, something which will become commonplace for her throughout the book. Laura meets her friends, minus Martin, who's doing some work, uh, by the pool, where they offer her wine in a plastic cup. So, the epitome of class here. The wine was delicious, cold and dot 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 wet. Really killing it with these descriptors. Since he's not present, Laura takes the opportunity to complain about Martin to her friend. Sometimes I can't stand him, I turned to Carolina, and she stared at me, eyes wide. I'll never be number one with him. You know, more important than work, friends, or hobbies. Sometimes I think he's with me just because he's got nothing better to do. It's a bit like having a dog. You pet it when you want, play around a little bit, but when you're bored, you, shoo it, you just shoo it away. It's there for you, not the other way around, right? Martin spends more time chatting with his friends on Facebook than with me at home not to mention in bed. Keep this in mind as we go throughout the book because while she complains about that with Martin, that's very much how she treats Massimo for a majority of the story. And at some point she decides she kinda likes him. So any initial off-putting aggression that he would display kinda gets brushed aside as she does what she can to spend more time with him and kind of just uses his money for self-gratification. Laura's a bad person, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So because Martin's ignoring her, Laura gets angry and drunk and decides to wander off on her own, at which point she is abducted by men in SUVs. And we open the next chapter as she wakes up. She's in a very nice, ornately decorated room uh, inside of a pretty substantial mansion, but uh, her friends are nowhere to be found, she's not sure exactly where she is, and uh, it turns out that she has been abducted by the mob. She's eventually shown through the house by uh, a young man, presumably Domenico, uh, to a library where she runs into Massimo. Please have a seat. You didn't react well to the sleeping pills. I had no idea you had a heart condition. What a romantic introduction to this new lifestyle. You started off by drugging her, and apparently she's been asleep for two days. How many sleeping pills was she fed? Have a seat, Laura. I will have to use force if you don't comply. I will not ask again. All right, yeah, there we go. Couple buttocks now. No. Grab her buttocks. Not disrespectful. Give her a little spank. No, I'm not doing that. Women like it when you cross the line. But Laura is so distraught and perplexed by this entire situation that she can just stand there 
unaware of what's really going on, unsure of her surroundings and her new situation. And uh, Massimo doesn't really react to this well, and we get this ridiculous description of, of his... just... this. Why aren't you listening to me, goddammit? The silhouette leapt from the balcony into the room and caught me before I could collapse onto the floor. Woo! Superhero landing! Yeah, that's really hard on your knees. Totally impractical, they all do it. I blinked, trying to clear my sight, and felt the man sitting me down in an armchair and putting an ice cube in my mouth. Suck it! It's cherry. Mm -hmm. This is so stupid. You're so disobedient, Laura. I have difficulty believing you're not Italian. What is with the Italian hate in this book? I don't get it. Mmm, Olive Garden is so good. I wish Ellie was real. Massimo tries to give his backstory to explain himself to Laura, saying that uh, he was in an accident for a little while, fell into a coma, and dreamed about her, and then reveals that he has a massive portrait of her over the fireplace. That's got to be some next level creepy. And because he had this vision of Laura, uh, he became obsessed with tracking her down, knowing that someday she would show up. and. Here she is. So, he's going to make her his. That was it. I snapped. I'm not anyone's property. I'm not a thing to own. And you can't just have me. Kidnap me and count on me just accepting that, I hissed. I know. That's why I'll give you a chance to fall in love with me and stay with me out of your own volition, rather than any compulsion I might impose. Keep in mind that if he had just continued watching her for another day or two while she was on vacation, he probably would have figured out how materialistic she is and how unhappy she was with her current relationship and would have been able to woo her normally. Despite the kidnapping, Laura claims that she has a boyfriend and friends and family that will come looking for her. And despite his connections, Massimo isn't able to stop everyone from looking for Laura or stop her from attempting to break free. So Massimo has to pull some strings. The first one comes down to a set of photos that he spills out all over the floor. My heart cramped and my eyes teared up. The photos showed Martin fucking another woman. They had been snapped secretly, but there was no doubt they showed my boyfriend. So Martin was apparently having an affair for some reason, despite Laura being described as drop dead gorgeous. It also doesn't really make sense, considering that he claimed that he had done his fair share of fucking already. This is one of those moments that kind of gets set up and kind of answered later on, but the author clearly didn't think a lot of things through because this particular moment does reflect later on, but not in a way that the book really means for you to reflect on it. Just keep it in mind. It, it exposes a lot of Massimo's hypocrisy unknowingly. Now, despite the kidnapping, Massimo does try to appeal to Laura's side of things and tries to make himself look like he's not that bad a guy. He grabs her, holds her close, and whispers, I will not do anything without your consent and willingness. Even if I think I already have it, I'll wait for you to want me, to need me, and to come to me out of your own will. Which doesn't mean that I don't want to enter you deep and stifle your screams with my tongue. You better get a mop and bucket ready with sexy talk like that. Those words, spoken so softly and silently, caused a wave of heat to ripple throughout my entire body. The words weren't spoken silently, he spoke them. That's not silent. I don't care if I'm being pedantic, this book is stupid. Also, keep in mind, this whole I won't do anything without your consent is kind of immediately defeated, considering that she has been kidnapped and he won't let her go. Massimo attempts to be open and honest with Laura by describing how Martin was a, a bad boyfriend and uh, explains that he had staff who were working at the club 
uh, that Martin was in. Apparently, Martin drank, had fun, and took an interest in one of the dancers, and, well, the pictures speak for themselves after that. Massimo also knew that Martin wasn't worthy of Laura because he didn't move a muscle to stop her after the, their last fight when Laura left. So, his people took Laura's things from her room and left a letter, uh, which was supposedly written to Martin, stating that she was leaving him and returning to Poland, moving out of his apartment and disappearing from his life. Hmm, that's not... weird. And Massimo gives this weirdly unaware statement. In the same paragraph, he states that she won't be able to go home for the next 365 days, but he will not make her do anything against her will. He wants to show her all the respect in the world. Any less requests, pig? Yeah, loosen the knot and let me go. Yeah, man! Of course we don't let him go! Yeah, yeah, but that! <laughs> he wants to show her respect, but won't even allow her to have basic autonomy. She's not even allowed to contact her parents for a while. Actually, speaking of her parents... Massimo hands her another envelope. I ripped it open and pulled out another set of photos, my hands shaking. What the fuck? Those were photos of my family, mom, dad, and my brother. In normal, everyday situations, taken near our house or out at lunch with friends through the bedroom window as they slept. What is this supposed to mean? I asked, disoriented and pissed to the brink of completely losing it. This is my insurance policy. You will not risk the life and safety of your family, will you? I know where they live, what they do, where they work, when they go to sleep, and what they eat for breakfast. I will not keep an eye on you the entire time. I know I won't be able to keep you in place when I'm out. I won't keep you under lock and key, either. The only thing I can do is give you an ultimatum. You give me a year, and your family will be safe and sound. I want to show you all the respect in the world! Your value to me is as high as my own life! Everything in my residence is at your disposal! Blow job! Blow job! Blow job! He's giving these weirdly inconsistent messages, and the book doesn't seem to be aware that he's contradicting himself. This even seems to contradict some of the uh, idea of the dark romance genre, because even though we have the power dynamic on full display here, he seems to be, like, Massimo is covering it up with this false nice guy persona. It's like the author doesn't want to fully commit to him being a terrible person, so it sets a weird image. Like, is he an awful, dreadful person, or is he willing to hold back a little bit in this particular case? You're not committing to the character you've set up. And even though he explains that she is his angel and he doesn't want to hurt her, that idea is immediately contradicted by holding her against her will. Now, if the dissonance was a point of his character, that he's struggling with who he was and who he wants to be around her, then that could be something. That could be an arc that you could really play with. But the book isn't self-aware enough with who Massimo is and what his actions actually entail. It's the idea, the things that he does is treated with the same severity of promising to do the dishes and then not doing the dishes. Something that's rude but can be Forgiven with a handshake. And speaking of terrible things, later that night, Laura looks out one of the windows and sees Massimo arguing with several people in the driveway. In the dark, I could see Massimo and several other people. There was a man kneeling before them, shouting something in Italian. His expression suggested terror and panic as he stared wide-eyed at the man in black. Massimo was standing there, at ease, his hands in the pockets of his casual pants. He was fixing the pleading man with an icy stare, waiting for him to finish. As soon as he did, Massimo impassively uttered a short sentence or two, took out his gun, and shot the man in the head. The victim's body flopped to the stone driveway. Now, the sight of seeing a man die is rather traumatic. So, Laura starts to freak out, Massimo overhears that, and runs up to, uh, to meet her. At which point, Massimo opens her mouth with one hand and slips a pill under her tongue. Apparently, it was heart medicine that the doctor left behind. And this makes Laura pass out. Now, I don't believe that Laura's heart condition is ever specified. We don't really find out 
what it is or what her medicine is. It's just that apparently the medicine knocks her out. I guess she's taking some sort of tranquilizer or something. The problem with it is her heart condition doesn't really manifest itself properly in the story. It only shows up when the plot needs it to. It becomes this matter of situational convenience in which she can spend however much time in whatever kind of stressful environment. We'll see later on that she gets forced onto a plane in a terrifying situation considering she's claustrophobic and Massimo's reaction is not at all helpful, but that doesn't cause any kind of a reaction. Uh, the, the constant alcoholism doesn't cause any kind of apparent upset. The stress that she goes through, through all the kidnapping and whatnot, sporadically causes some sort of a reaction, but not in any way that seems to manifest consistently. It's just a plot convenient heart condition that shows up because I guess that's part of her personality. Very much like Bella just being clumsy. It comes off as a shallow experience because it doesn't deepen the character in any real way. It's just there to be there. And I guess to occasionally explain why she passes out because that's what the pills do. The next chapter opens with Laura waking up. And I mention that because it happens a lot. Here are all the chapters in which Laura opens the chapter by waking up. An idea which by itself isn't a bad one. It's actually kind of a normal way to open some chapters, but when you open with that many chapters, it means that the idea has become a crutch. And you can't really master writing if you rely on crutches and only work within your comfort zone. So Laura wakes up and realizes she's wearing different clothes than the ones she fell asleep in. Her immediate thought is that Massimo must have changed her because she's on very powerful tranquilizers apparently, but he assures her that no, it wasn't him. Maria, my cousin did it, he was saying. I wasn't even there. I promised you I won't do anything without your consent, though I won't pretend I wasn't tempted to watch, especially because you were unconscious, so defenseless. This guy's not creepy at all. How is this guy a sex icon? Then again, considering his opening scene, it's apparent that Massimo likes his girls defenseless. Laura confronts Massimo about how he murdered a man in cold blood in the driveway. But don't worry, he has a totally logical reason for his actions. He betrayed the family. I am its head, so he betrayed me. Massimo leaned closer. I told you, but apparently you thought I was joking. I do not tolerate defiance and insubordination, Laura. There is nothing as important as loyalty. You are not yet ready for all this, and you can't be... Uh, can't ever be ready for what you saw yesterday. Because nothing builds loyalty like constant unending trauma! And even though it is not situationally appropriate, he gets on the bed, climbs on top of Laura, pinning her to the bed, and I went rigid with terror and it must have shown on my face. Massimo saw it and he liked it. Massimo likes his girls when they're afraid. I know I said earlier that this was just a fantasy and everyone's got their own kink, but I find it perplexing that anyone with a functioning frontal lobe could find this attractive. And despite no logical reason for an attraction here, Laura displays a good amount of cognitive dissonance here as she is both terrified by Massimo and attracted to him for some reason. Massimo clamped his hand even harder on the back of my head, trailing his nose across my face. He inhaled deeply, taking in the scent of my skin. I wanted to close my eyes to show him the depth of my contempt to overcome, uh, to overcome my own fear, but I was hypnotized by the savagery of his gaze and couldn't take my eyes off him. He was a beautiful man, exactly my type. Black eyes, dark hair, large and full lips, a light stubble on his face, now delicately tickling my cheeks and that body. Long, lean legs around my hips, strong and muscular arms, and a wide chest that I could see through the tight tank top. Like I said, I won't do anything without your consent, but I don't know if I'll be able to stop myself after all. You know, this is like those memes that people started making about Fifty Shades of Grey after that came out. The only reason it got away with all the crap in that is because Christian Grey was very attractive. If he was just some random weirdo from a shack in the middle of a swamp, it wouldn't have been a romantic erotic thriller, it would be an episode of Criminal Minds. 
Same thing with this nonsense. I want to have you, Laura. I need to have you whole. He was trailing his nose along my face. When you're so fragile and helpless, I want you even more. I want to fuck you like nobody ever did before. I want you to feel pain and rapture. I want to be your last lover. He was saying all this while his hips were rhythmically rubbing against me. Bad touch! Bad touch! Stranger danger! This book could actually serve as an important lesson for all the teenage guys out there who are trying to learn how to talk to women. Read what Massimo does and then do literally the opposite. Now, despite as horrifying as this whole scene has been so far, it does have a small glimmer of potential, and Laura even gets an unironic you go girl out of me. He moaned, and before I could react, his tongue was already in my mouth, pushing itself in frantically deep in a desperate search for my own. His grip on my hand slackened, and I could free my arm. Engrossed by the kiss, he didn't notice. I raised my right knee and pushed him away, simultaneously slapping him in the face with my free hand. Is this the respect you said you'd show me? I screamed. I remember you saying something about waiting for my express consent instead of misinterpreting any, per uh, any perceived signs. Now, I like this moment because it shows that she's willing to push back against the situation she's stuck in. She's kind of fighting against what the plot wants her to do. That's good, because this situation is terrifying, and any normal person would act exactly like this. It's believable. I like it, and Massimo's a creep, so physical violence in this situation is entirely appropriate. But Massimo laughs off this act of defiance and says that this is going to be a great year. He then gives Laura some degree of freedom and outlines what she's allowed to do. Uh, saying that her things have been brought here to his home. It's been arranged in her closets. Uh, they're going to need to get her some new outfits, of course. She's got the room to herself. Uh, she has servants, bodyguards. She'll be getting a phone and a computer that she can use as she wants. The residence has a private beach, jet skis, all that stuff. There's a pool. She's got a whole bunch of stuff at her disposal that she's free to use whenever and however she wants. With Minor limitations. And we get the first bit of potential Stockholm Syndrome setting in. I think I had a crush on my captor. There was no way to know if it was my subconscious reaction to Martin's betrayal, I need to take some kind of revenge, or else the desire to show Massimo just how tough I could be. Now, captor romance often gets labeled uh, with accusations of Stockholm Syndrome, and not entirely without reason, especially in this case. There doesn't really seem to, like, I've, I've got more to say, and I don't really want to go on a big ramble about this quite yet, but there doesn't really seem to be any depth in this relationship. The reaction, the attraction between these two is entirely surface level and materialistic. The only reason Laura's going along with this, apparently, is because Massimo is hot. Again, if he weren't, this would be an episode of Criminal Minds. Laura starts exploring her new surroundings and notes that the mansion looks like the mansion from Dynasty, which is a 1980s soap opera. I had never heard of it, I had to look it up. And this is a small note that I kind of like about her perception. A number of times throughout the story, Laura relates her experiences to various TV shows. Uh, Dynasty shows up more than once. At one point she mentions uh, Desperate Housewives, and that seems entirely appropriate because a lot of her actions make her sound like a stock character in a soap opera. But this is a good way of coloring in the setting and the character because now we understand how Laura perceives things. She relates them to various black TV shows that she's watched and apparently enjoys. And so that gives us an understanding about not only what she watches, but possibly what she sees as role models, um, especially considering how she acts when she goes on her multi multiple uh, shopping sprees. A romance story of a mafia don meeting a young woman could totally work, but not like this. Massimo is irredeemable at the start of the book. The Don isn't a good version of the story, could do terrible things and run a criminal empire, but still have a few soft spots that the woman could work towards revealing. Beauty and the Beast does this very effectively, where the prince is 
somewhat selfish and self-centered, completely ignoring the Disney version, the fact that he was supposed to be about 10 when he didn't let a stranger come into his house when his parents weren't around. That's a very creepy image, Disney. But he was something of a selfish slob, which Belle was able to rectify and turn him into a better person. The idea works in concept, but the problem is the parallels are warped. Laura isn't as smart or dynamic a character as Belle, and isn't really focused on improving Massimo as a person, she just wants to go along with the riches. Massimo himself can't really be redeemed, the only way to fix him is to set him on fire. Brother, get the flamer. The heavy flamer. <laughs> But Laura goes most of a full day without seeing Massimo, just wandering around, sun tanning at the pool, reading the paper, and trying to get used to her new surroundings. She wakes up the next morning with Massimo cuddling her, and Massimo was clearly amused, and his carefree attitude quickly rubbed off on me. For a while, we stood face to face, like a couple of flirting teenagers. I could feel the tension between us, the fear and the lust. I thought we were both feeling the same thing, only the cause of our fear was different. And it's been less than a week, Massimo confirms that he only has 359 days left with her. Laura seems to be going along with her kidnapping pretty well. Her mood seems to have softened in response to how nice her surroundings are, but she was still kidnapped and is being held against her will under the threat of her family being murdered by a violent criminal who doesn't have an issue with killing someone in cold blood. I can accept that Laura might grow attracted to the man after a while, but this feels too easy. It doesn't feel like she's growing accustomed to the luxury and the man who provided it for her. It feels like she needed to be relaxed for the plot to happen. She doesn't even offer any pushback against Massimo when he suggests they're about to leave wherever they are. This isn't helped when Laura explains that she feels fear and lust, pointedly describing how she feels without any substance or actions to back up her claim. The entire situation starts to overwhelm Laura and she starts to have a panic attack, so... Massimo uh, grabs her and starts stroking her hair and swaying softly, saying that his mother used to do it to calm him down when he was little. This man was so full of contradictions, a tender barbarian, the perfect way to describe him. Dangerous, imperious, intolerant of any defiance, but at the same time, so caring and delicate. The mixture of all those things was terrifying, but also fascinating and intriguing. I could appreciate the balance to make a complex character, but this doesn't really reflect the selfishness or scumminess that the book opened with. It's like the opening less than happy participant sex scene was brushed under a blanket of not a nice thing to do, as opposed to being incredibly evil. So we've got cold-blooded murder, criminal empire, kidnapping, and unwilling participant sex scenes on one side, but that's all somehow balanced out by head pats from senpai. And just so I am not accused of being overly biased, I will compliment the book again. As they're going on a shopping spree, Laura compares everything to the shopping spree out of Pretty Women. Me showing off in new hot and sexy outfits and him playing the role of my Horn Reaper fan. I do like that the author came in with just a, a smidge of information in this regard because it shows Laura's perception of things without being heavy-handed. It's, it's actually good. This is not something that I have a problem with. What I do have a problem with... Their last stop is at Victoria's Secret, so that Laura can, of course, get sexy, trendy new underwear. At which point, while she's trying it on, Massimo walks in on her, uh, and has a violent reaction. As I stood back up and looked in the mirror, I realized Massimo was standing behind me. He was leaning against the changing room wall with his hands in his pockets and observing me, taking in the view. I spun around, glaring at him. What are you? I managed before he shot out his arm, grabbing me by the throat and slamming me into the mirror. This came out of nowhere, so it makes him look unpredictable. We also know he's capable of incredible violence since he murdered a man, and Laura knows this, and he knows Laura knows this. So this sends a very unsettling image to his personality. In context, he's trying to be sexy, but this came out so suddenly that anyone's first impression, and there's no way the author didn't know this, is one of controlling impetuous violence. The author tries to excuse this with him being like overly aroused because he says, don't move, he purred, pinning me with his wild, icy stare. He dropped his eyes and moaned softly. You look pretty, but you can't wear these. Not yet. 
Given his violent outbursts, is there any reason to believe that Massimo would honor his deal of releasing Laura after a year? Or is there any reason to believe he wouldn't come after her violently again? Laura does stand up for herself and says, Leave or I guarantee this will be the last time you see me like this. And his response is... He smirked, accepting the challenge. His hand tightened on my neck. His eyes flared with fury and lust as he took a, a step forward, and then another one. I felt the mirror on my back again. That's when he let go of me and said, I picked everything for you. I will decide when I want you to wear this. But this bizarre attraction between the two of them continues later on at dinner, when Laura has to dress up and Massimo meets her for whatever the hell they're eating. They kind of flirt with each other in really awkward ways, with such thrilling dialogue as, I gasped, aroused. He went on, your smell. I felt it as soon as you stepped in that doorway. I'd like to lick it off you. Saying that, he started to tighten his grip on my shoulders rhythmically. There is one spot on your body that scent is absent, I'd wager. And it's the same place I'd like to explore the most. I can almost taste it. <laughs> Dinner concludes, they go out to the garden and uh, start chatting with each other, where Massimo says, I'd like you to teach me how to be gentle with you. Then less than four paragraphs later on the next page, Wait, stop! I breathe, pushing him away. The man in black did no such thing. He grabbed me by the wrist, despite my protestations, and pinned them to the sofa. Then he lifted me, tightly clamping his hand around both my wrists. His other hand trailed along my thigh, climbing until it felt the lace thong. And I won't continue down there because it gets worse and I would like this video to be monetized. Baby girl, he breathed heavily, when you've been using nothing but violence for your whole life and you've had to fight tooth and nail for everything you have, it's difficult to react in any other way when someone takes away what you desire. So it isn't that Massimo was a powerful man in control of his surroundings, it's that he's a petulant child who's prone to throwing temper tantrums. The next chapter starts, Laura opens it by waking up, and Massimo is cuddling with her. Laura begins taking a shower, and Massimo walks in to ask if he can join. And even though she wanted to uh, pummel him, she knew that that would get a negative reaction out of him. So she just gives in and says, sure, be my guest, because, you know, that's exactly what consent is. Oh, but it's okay, because it'll give her a chance to see him without his clothes on either. And the scene mechanically makes sense, because it's here to heighten the sexual tension between these two. Just, I'm, I'm taking that in a vacuum, because that's, that's kind of how you have to analyze everything, because larger context makes this entire book an absolute migraine. And we get another reminder that Martin didn't like sex for some reason. When had I last had sex? I asked myself. Martin had always treated it as a sporadic and unpleasant duty, and yet still found the strength to go and cheat on her. Hmm, I wonder why. And we get a full description of what Massimo looks like without his clothes on, and uh, I'm just gonna leave you with this line. It was perfect. Not too long, but as thick as my wrist. You may use your imaginations appropriately. <laughs> well, the whole shower scene makes Laura rather hot and bothered, so we get a scene of her taking care of herself for 30 minutes, and then she goes to meet Massimo because apparently he's taking her on a trip out somewhere for an undetermined amount of time. Laura is also introduced to Massimo's right-hand man, Mario. <laughs> Laura leaves to an SUV outside that's going to take them on, uh, on their trip, and apparently her iPhone is inside with dozens of missed calls from her mother, but not even one from Martin. It gets a little distracting with how much uh, Lipinska is trying to build up the like everything that she's doing with Barton. It it's becomes really obvious foreshadowing for something later on that doesn't really amount to anything. It, it's very clumsily handled, unfortunately. So Laura calls her mother, who was worried sick, and comes up with a cover story. Says that she was offered a great job in one of the best hotels on Sicily. She doesn't say what the job is, but says that it's a one-year contract that she decided to accept. I suppose that, you know, details like job titles aren't terribly important in a cover story like that, but 
Whatever. Massimo gives Laura a very expensive watch uh, from a company called Patek Philippe. Sounds expensive, at least. And then they head off to the airport with one of the more troubling scenes. Gonna have to put another big warning on this one, but uh, Massimo takes Laura to the plane, and it's not like a decent, I imagine, 747 or whatever she was flying on before. This is a small private plane. She actually refers, it to, uh, refers to it as a toy plane. And remember, she's claustrophobic and hates flying, so the combination of being on the very small plane causes a panic attack. And Massimo, of course, is very considerate of Laura's emotions in the moment. He actually picks her up while she's screaming and flailing her arms around, carries her into the plane, and throws her on a couch. She tries to leave the plane. Uh, instead, he makes things worse. Intending to gag me, he pressed his lips to mine and pushed his tongue into my mouth. I was in no mood for play, though, and as soon as he did it, I bit. Hard. The man in black leapt back, raising his arm as if he were going to hit me. I squeezed my eyes shut and waited for the inevitable. The strike did not come. When I opened my eyes again, he was undoing his belt. Oh God, what's he going to do? Now, normally in this situation, you'd want to try to reassure the person. Like, I mean, the better option is don't get on the plane at all. He's got the money he can afford to go himself and then take her via a car or something. But short of that, you'd want to reassure the person, give them some sense of control, uh, let them feel like they actually have some degree of autonomy or authority. Instead, Massimo does exactly the opposite and really makes things considerably worse. You'll choose your punishment now, Laura. I warned you not to resist. Now give me your hands. Still staring into his eyes, I did as he asked. He grabbed both my wrists and deftly tied them with a leather belt. So she's tied up, and yes, it does get worse. So you don't have to think too hard. I'll tell you what your choices are, he said slowly, keeping his voice cold. Each time you hit me in the face, you show a lack of respect. It is insulting, Laura. Therefore, I'll make you feel what I feel. You might not like it, but your punishment is going to be corporeal. You can choose now. I would suggest that you suck that. Or let me... But remember, he's not going to make her do anything she doesn't want to do. Hey, Lagoshi, do you know what a service top is? <laughs> We've got an hour in this plane ahead of us, Laura, and you will have your punishment before we land. I'm nothing if not fair. At least I let you choose. He squinted at me, licking his lips. But my patience will run out. Soon. And then I'll do the same thing you did, which is whatever I want. I can understand why having a domineering guy in a relationship might be attractive, but considering the situational context of everything, this isn't domineering, this is coercion. Especially when you get lines like this. As he approached me, I closed my eyes, let it happen, I wanted it to be over. So Laura chooses her punishment and decides to... There she blows. And Massimo takes her into a private sleeping room, it, like, I guess. It's got a bed in there. But instead of honoring the choice that she made, he does the opposite. Pleasuring me wouldn't be any kind of punishment for you, he whispered. I know you've been wanting to do it since morning, but if I do it to you without your control, we'll be square. He tore my pants off abruptly. The prose doesn't give Laura a safe feeling or impression. She doesn't want to be here, and her choosing to... Below you a kiss. ...is made out of coercion, so it's not a real choice. This is gross. Even considering that, he goes against her choice, which makes me question why give her the choice at all. Laura begs him not to do anything, and he says, I asked you two not to hit me. Considering that she was retaliating against Massimo for plunging his tongue down her throat while she was panicking, she can hardly be blamed for biting him. 
This isn't like a BDSM relationship where there's a reasonable co uh, connection and relationship based on understanding and consent. This is abuse and assault committed by a stranger that Laura met two days ago. I'm willing to let people have their power fantasies, but why does such flagrant assault get a pass in any way? Why does this book get a movie deal effectively glorifying the acts? This isn't being framed in a way that demonizes what Massimo was doing. This is supposed to be erotic, but it's gross. Despite saying that he would let Laura choose, and she chose choice A, Massimo disregards this and goes with option B. If he claims that it's a virtue that he gave her a choice, then why isn't he honoring that choice? Why doesn't Laura notice that he's going against what he said? This feels sloppy, like the uh, writer didn't have a real plan and is just going with whatever she felt like in that exact moment that she was typing, despite what she typed on the prior page. So, he goes down on her and she enjoys herself. The uh, whole event did a lot to calm her down, and I know I don't really need to say this, but that is a terrible way to go about calming someone down in a panic attack. And Massimo is just trying to be coy after the whole event. My lips smell of your pussy. Now, suddenly I'm not so sure if you were the one punished. And then, because the plot needs her to act like this, Laura just goes on as if the whole event didn't really happen. You could actually start a counting gag with how many times that happens. Once they're off the plane, Massimo starts ordering Laura around inside of a car, and she claims that you order me around like a dog, I am no dog, and he responds with, not a dog, a bitch, he hissed, tying my hands with some kind of strap. How frightfully rude. I certainly hope someone stabs him in the eye. So he's driving down the road. Her hands are tied behind the seat with a, uh, a belt from a bathrobe. And apparently she's in pain because he's, uh, like her back hurts and her arms hurt from the way that she's tied. And he claims that he'll help take her mind off of the pain. You promised you wouldn't do anything against my wishes, I whispered, leaning back. Massimo's fingers irritated smearing it with wetness that appeared as soon as he touched me. I'm not doing anything against your wishes. I'm just making sure your hands aren't in pain anymore. So this sounds very much like he is indicating that the apparent arousal is a sign of consent or approval, which is a common argument among rapists. Great, great love interest. That's... Hmm. Now, Laura does think a lot of angry things aimed at Massimo, and I like the defiance. I like that she's trying to stand up for herself. The problem is, whenever it really counts, she never really does anything against Massimo for, for the sake of any of her independence or autonomy. Once they arrive at the hotel they'll be staying at, Laura starts thinking to herself, uh, you know, very angry things aimed at Massimo, and she'll occasionally talk against him and won't do everything that he wants her to do, but at this point she starts to turn it into a game because she is kind of turned on by him for some reason. And what little resistance she does display doesn't really manifest much for the rest of the book. It, it like, it diminishes more and more and what resistance she does put up is little better than getting drunk and throwing a tantrum. And eventually that stops by like the halfway point of the book. So whatever independence Laura could have displayed is pretty much shot to hell. She doesn't get in the way of the plot from this point. She just goes along with what the plot needs her to do instead of what her character has been established up to this point. Remember, she's been described as uh, fiercely dominant uh, in her relationship with Martin, and now that she's counteracting that with Massimo, she eventually becomes kind of wilting in his presence. And what dominance she attempts to play with, like, it's there, but but only as far as it can serve the plot. As far as actual independence and actually standing up for herself, forget it, Laura is just Massimo's plaything.
The situation does turn somewhat humorous, though, because thanks to the mess that he made in the car, Massimo has a problem to hide himself, and Laura's dress is a bit damp. So Massimo pulled Laura onto himself, on his lap, in the car, and stepped out with Laura's legs still wrapped around him, and... When Massimo and Domenico were finished talking, Massimo opened the door and stepped out, keeping his hold on me. We headed toward the hotel he had parked the car next to. I was still clutching him, my legs around his hips. I could feel the surprised stares of the other guests as we passed them without a word, Massimo keeping a poker face. They're walking like he's carrying her in a baby harness, and we're supposed to take this seriously. That's not intimidating or erotic, it's amusing, but like, at the cost of the protagonist and love interest. They get up to a private room, a nice penthouse suite, and Massimo tries to turn on the charm and it doesn't really work. Laura decides that she doesn't really want to have anything to do with him, and she does have an amusing line here. He asks if she will give him a hand, and she says, I'm not going to help you with anything. Besides, you've got people for everything. Why don't you ask them? I raised my eyes. Can I go now? So Laura decides she doesn't want to be around Massimo and says, let me out. I want to leave. Uh, to which he responds by locking the door and not letting her leave. But remember, he's not going to do anything that she doesn't want to. He then says, I'll do what I want with you and ties her to the bed using handcuffs and a spreader bar. We get a scene of Massimo banging a prostitute in front of Laura so that she knows what she's missing out on. Yeah, but the hose! Oh, what? It's too hard to get the hose! They go out on the town to one of the clubs that Massimo owns, but in retaliation for the whole banging a prostitute thing, Laura decides to dress rather provocatively, shall we say. You're not going out with all that makeup on. But, Dad! Upstairs, you're a McDonald, not a whore. Laura goes to meet Massimo at the club, where we finally get to see some hint of what he does professionally. Now, he owns a club, and it's, you know, your standard rich people nightclub sort of thing, so everything looks posh and expensive and clean, and of course, there are drug deals being made. And not just the average drug deals, we're talking over the top. Suddenly, Domenico broke my reverie by lifting the dome from the silver platter. I shot a glance at what was on it and nearly choked. It was cocaine. The drug, divided into several dozen neat little lines, covered the entire platter. Illicit drug deals in this situation I would get, but is the silver platter really necessary? Your wig, sir. Well, keep in mind, Laura did come here in order to provoke Massimo, and she does so by acting as provocative as possible. One of the ways she does this is by pole dancing. She happens to have taken classes for it because of course she did. When I had moved to Warsaw, I started taking pole dancing lessons. At first, I thought it was all about sexy squirming, but my instructor quickly taught me better. Pole dancing was the perfect way to keep your body in shape. It was a bit like gymnastics, only on a pole. <laughs> Things don't go terribly well when Laura does what she does and drinks a whole bunch of champagne and gets a wee bit tipsy. She goes to mock Massimo, and one of the business partners that he was meeting with mistook her for a common prostitute, grabbed her, and groped her. Massimo rescues Laura from the situation and uh, enacts punishment by... Well, we're led to believe that he's going to kill the guy at first, but the solution is actually a little more ridiculous. Speaking of ridiculous, it is too early for food. Don't give me that. No. Massimo takes the gropey boy uh, into a back room while Domenico pulls Laura out of the club and uh, shoves a pill under her tongue. And a gunshot goes off in the air and the music stops and there's this 
big intensity for a moment until Massimo comes out and actually explains what he did. Did you kill him? I asked in a whisper, praying that he didn't. No. I breathed out and turned onto my back. I only shot off his hands. He won't be touching you again. Now, I'm not going to say that that was a bad solution considering the circumstances. I'm going to question how did Massimo shoot off the guy's hands using a handgun and one bullet? If he'd used a shotgun, maybe he could have ruined the guy's hands to the point where they were beyond repair, especially if they were shot at point blank. I don't know how you could shoot off a guy's hands with a small caliber round. That doesn't work. It sounds like the author was just making things up. Now, this is a small point. It's not going to derail the entire narrative. It just sounds like Lipinska wanted to have the moment in there because it sounded kind of neat, not that it made sense. Now, there are ways you can get around that. For example, in Dick Wolf's The Intercept, he uh, depicts a terrorist creating a type of powdered explosive and goes into a lot of detail about how, that, uh, how the material was made and how it was utilized. Problem was, he made a number of mistakes. But there are mistakes that your average person is not going to really understand. You actually have to have a decent understanding of explosives in the first place to know what is actually going on. And you don't really want to have detailed exp uh, explanations on how to make explosives out there for the public anyway. So in a situation like that, okay, fine, you can, you can mess up or ignore a few technical details. But for something as basic as using a single round to blow off a guy's hands because it says specifically I only shot off his hands it just sounds lazy like there's there's an obvious degree of logic that you have intentionally ignored for the sake of having a neat moment in your book now despite this what should be a traumatic moment because Laura uh, for a moment did feel a little guilty. We get a paragraph describing her reaction when she heard the gunshot, like the blood drained from her face, her legs buckled. Obviously there's a degree of connection that she felt, maybe not responsibility, but uh, a bit of fear, maybe even trauma. Well, all that's ignored by the next page when Massimo comes to talk to her and she's really in the mood for fun times, as it were. She grabs another drink, and I will give Massimo a little bit of credit for his actions in this moment. Laura, you do not drink spirits. And after taking your medication, all the champagne you've had at the club, this is not a good idea. And even though she is very drunk and very willing, he puts her to bed, says it was a bad idea for her to drink more, and then says good night, and then leaves. Me. I can't, darling. Why not? Because you're drunk, it's not right. It is something of a noble moment, but considering everything else that he's done, it's worth pocket lint. It's like praising little Johnny for eating his vegetables after he set the house on fire. Good job, but things are so out of balance at this point. And the nobility of the moment is kind of erased considering that Massimo actually handcuffed Laura to the bed and left her there all night. I jerked my hands, but the sound of metal scraping against wood nearby made my brain burst. I waited silently and took a look around. There was nobody there. Now again, this is one of those small moments that doesn't derail the core whateverism of the book, but that is a very dangerous thing to do. Sunstone actually covers a uh, plot point very similarly. There was a girl, uh, one of the characters in the book, who wanted to surprise her boyfriend by tying herself to the bed but didn't know that he had an extended shift that day and didn't tie the knots uh, in a way that she could you know, pull herself free from and uh, nearly lost all circulation in her arms. It, it's a really well-balanced story. It's, it's got a lot of good sex appeal and uh, practical lessons about BDSM. This also ignores a lot of other basics that Massimo should have considered, like what if Laura had to run to the bathroom in the middle of the night? What if she had to uh, turn or move and wound up choking or sleeping in her own vomit? There are lots of problems with this idea, which ruins the 
very brief nobility that Massimo actually displayed. Although I'm not sure nobility is really the right thing to call it when it should be like the baseline standard for decency. I didn't murder you! That means I deserve a cookie! Oh, and uh, the book does provide a convenient cop-out for why Laura wasn't horribly traumatized by the shooting at the club because... I tried remembering what had happened last night, but the only thing I could recall was my pole dance. I cast amnesia on Osric. <sighs> Osric has no memory of the last two minutes. Nice dodge. It's almost like the author needed a way to keep Laura away from all these horrifying moments because otherwise it would become too unrealistic why she wasn't terribly traumatized by all of them. I think the idea of a power dynamic like this can work in a romance, but it would really help if Massimo had any redeeming qualities. So far, the only thing he's really got going for him is that he won't force himself on Laura. Congratulations! You've achieved the bare minimum and reached what the rest of us call baseline morality. Now, there are ways that you can take what is normally a villainous character or something that you would assume is a villainous character and make them really appealing or look like they have at least some noble traits. I'm reminded of a cutscene from, I believe it is Vanguard Squadron. There's a cutscene I saw from that uh, in which you follow a, an Imperial pilot uh, as they're losing a battle and the Empire decides to retreat. Now there are a lot of villainous things you can say about the Empire. There are a number of comparisons you can make to one of the bad guy teams in World War II. But the cutscene follows an Imperial pilot uh, flying an interceptor and as the order to retreat comes in he states that they still have troops out in the uh, out on the field. And rather than flee to safety, he flies back to try to save some of them. This is Titan 3. I'm pinned down. Come on, we still have ties out. We're not handing the enemy one more destroyer, Captain. The Overseer is leaving. I'm not gonna make it. And this is at great cost because he ends up getting left behind. There's a degree of sacrifice in risking himself for the sake of others, for his teammates, and like them or not, there is something admirable in trying to do that, in trying to save others. The problem is Massimo has been set up to be this villainous caricature, but we haven't really seen anything noble or outstanding about him, like not in any real capacity anyway. And because of that, he's devoid of any real complexity in his character. He is this simple archetype. And if that's all that he's meant to be, then fine, so be it. The problem is he's being treated like he's something more more complex, more deep. You know, he had a, a tragic backstory where he had to fight for everything he had. And I don't accept that. I don't accept that Massimo is some secret deep character with a, a tragic backstory that makes everything make sense. The guy's a self-interested sociopath. And while Bell in Beauty and the Beast did a lot to tame the beast and civilize him, Laura doesn't seem interested in taming Massimo, for lack of a better word. I know that the, the appeal of dark romance is that the um, victim ends up successful in the end, and that's why fans of the series will go on and read the books to see how they overcome uh, their captors' initial behaviors and attitudes. But somehow the bare minimum is enough to charm Laura. Massimo had to go off on business for a little bit, and Laura was invited to visit his yacht, the Titan. She spent several days by herself, and when he, when Massimo finally does show up, she realizes that she had missed him. Looking at him, I realized I had been missing him for the past few days. Now, if the book wants to set this up like some sort of a romance, in addition to the 
sex appeal that it thinks it's playing at, then that's fine. But chemistry is extremely difficult to get right in a book, especially when the relationship is incredibly toxic like this one. Laura says she's been missing Massimo for the last few days, but we don't have a solid grasp on why. She's been missing Massimo since he's been gone, which could amount to just boredom. Aside from sexual attraction, which is very easy to set up, we've seen nothing to suggest attraction of any other sort. What I think Lipinska is working uh, to make this a deeper, more romantic attraction, but we need to have a real reason for it. There's nothing that they complement each other with, there's nothing that they bond over, there's nothing they really even have in common aside from a, you know, enjoying sex, and that's... Oh boy, that's such a hard thing to find in common with other people. They don't really bond over anything. This is one of the most shallow depictions of romance I can recall reading among anything, and that includes Twilight. Like, even The Mister did romance better than this. The Mister was awkward and dull and tedious, but at least there was an attempt to be nice. Laura has a bit of an accident and uh, actually falls off of the yacht at one point, and Massimo has to jump in and save her, but at, at this point, it's not like saving a person. It feels more like you're saving your favorite pillow that fell overboard. We have no reason to believe that Laura is anything more than an object in Massimo's point of view. Well, apparently Laura's longing or boredom or whatever you want to call it was enough to push her over the edge as the two of them start dancing horizontally. And we get the the first sex scene between the two of them. I'm not going to go over the scene in detail, for obvious reasons. I will say that Laura wanted him to finish on her stomach, and he refuses to. And keep in mind, they're not using any protection, and Laura doesn't use birth control pills or anything like that. And Massimo reveals something really dark. And no matter what I, I tell you here, it gets worse. You're right, you can't trust those pills. But you have a contraceptive implant, see? Saying that, he touched the inside of my left bicep. There was a short tube barely visible under my skin. He let me go, and I realized he wasn't joking. When you fell asleep that first night, I ordered it implanted. I didn't want to risk anything. It'll work for three years, but you can remove it after the first. He explained with a smile. Like, this moment was so disturbing, I actually, like, audibly gasped when I got to this scene. The, the levels of invasiveness that this hits. Like, before they had had a real conversation with each other, he had forcibly implanted a method of birth control into her. Like, let's... Let's just play this out differently. Let's say that she had resisted him every step of the way for the full year and then got away from him and didn't know about the implant. Like, let's say that he never told her because he didn't tell her up to this point. Why would we believe that he would tell her when he finally released her? Honestly, it would seem in character for him to not tell her at all, purely out of spite, to piss her off. You know, get a little revenge, because she didn't become subservient or whatever. But no matter how bad you think that is, we're going to be coming back to it because it gets so much worse. The implant thing <laughs> is one of the darker elements of this book. And of course, after their first time together, there's got to be pillow talk. And Massimo sucks at it. When I saw your face for the first time, I didn't desire you. I was terrified by that vision. But with time, when your portraits were all around my house, I began to notice the details of your soul. You and I are so alike, Laura. I, aside from the fact that you and I are so alike is just a cliched villain line at this point. The, the idea that he would start getting an idea to her soul because he hallucinated her and then put her portrait all over her his house. Which doesn't send all sorts of alarm bells going off. But aside from the multiple differences, yeah, sure, they're alike. I mean, they both like 
nice rich things and sex. I'm honestly trying to think of other things. And I'm coming up empty. A lot of you are probably uh, aware that Laura doesn't seem to react to really big news the way that a normal person would. And you may be asking, what's Laura's reaction to the surprise surgery? I kept still, looking into his eyes and feeling the anger leave me. I adored it when he was open with me. It didn't come easy to him, and I appreciated the effort. Oh, super dick move, but weirdly kind of cool to admit it. Jeez, you guys really are bred for forgiveness. Let's go. And I've said before that Massimo treats Laura more like property than a person, and I think that this paragraph sums that up pretty effectively. That first night, I watched you until the sun came up. I could feel your scent, the heat of your body. You were alive, real, and you were right there next to me. I couldn't believe it. I had this irrational fear that I, when I came back, you wouldn't be there anymore. Ignoring the typo for a moment, keep in mind that the way that he talks about her, she's not a person, she's a thing. There's no uh, attempt to understand who she is, to try to get her side of things, to try to understand her wants, her desires, to try to woo her. He just, hey, that looks neat, I want, give me. They decide to go again, and there's a line here that Laura gives that I think really solidifies just how toxic this relationship is. I wanted him to know what I felt. I needed to punish him for everything, hurt him, and I only knew one way to do that. She tries playing around with humiliation play, but the idea that she needs to hurt him in order to get even is, at this point, kind of expected. Laura takes control in the bedroom and says that she wanted to punish and hurt Massimo. This is an extremely toxic relationship. This isn't like those goofy anime relationships where characters just go back and forth antagonizing each other until they realize they really like each other. Massimo is actually making really damaging choices without consulting Laura, and Laura is being really self-destructive as a way to get back at Massimo, almost like she's trying to damage his property as a, uh, like a spoiled child. The property angle is also backed by the highlight on the prior page that I just read. And this is an attitude and a set of behavior between the two of them that is reinforced. They kind of exist next to each other, then they hook up, then they get pissed off, then they exist next to each other, then they hook up, then they get pissed off. It goes back and forth like that so many times. It's not quite the cycle of abuse that I detailed in my uh, Twilight Eclipse video part four specifically, but these two are like the troubled early 20s relationship where you got the boyfriend and girlfriend that are really dysfunctional and they break up like 10 times a month and they never improve. So the romance angle of this entire book is, is dead on its feet, shuffling away zombie style like Weekend at Bernie's. How do you like that? I gets laid more dead than I do alive. No, she couldn't have. He couldn't have. I get yelled at when I just lay there. There's also a line that suggests that Laura literally gets off by slapping people. <laughs> this is incredible. I shall call you Slappy and you shall be my Slappy. Okay. The next morning they go at it again and Laura says that if not for the implant, she would be ovulating right about now. And she really doesn't seem to mind that implant. Gee, I wonder if this is going to build to something. Massimo has to go into town for a little bit because of an urgent meeting. And he leaves Laura with a new diving instructor, some guy named Merrick. <laughs> meep, meep. Uh, his name is Merrick, but everyone calls him Marco. I don't get it, but okay. And this is one of those things that I think could have actually been used well, but was confusingly skipped. Massimo leaves, threatens to kill uh, Marik, Marco if he touches Laura, and then he leaves. And then Marik, Marco... I, I'm calling it back and forth because it keeps jumping back and forth between how it refers to him. The thing that's kind of annoying about Merrick Marco is the book refers to him 
by both names kind of interchangeably with no apparent logic to it. On one page, it'll call him Merrick. On the next, it'll refer to Marco. And it's like, if you're not paying attention, you might assume that there's a different character in there. But anyway, we get a scene of Merrick Marco teaching Laura how to go scuba diving. And the scene is disappointingly short. When Marco was packing up our equipment after the diving session, the sun was deep orange in color. This could have been a moment where you explore some of Laura's character or got some of her thoughts in a new environment, gotten her to act a certain way around a new character. There are ways that you can explore personalities in small segments like this. It doesn't have to be some massive revelation. It doesn't have to be this big plot centric scene that has uh, ripples down throughout the rest of the book. It can just be a small moment by itself where the character is in a new environment and gets to express themselves uh, freely or whatever. That's the disappointing thing about this book. There are all sorts of things where opulence and wealth are, are being spread left and right, shown for sometimes the sake of just doing it, but we don't have any real depth to it. There's no real purpose beyond look at how flashy this is, which should be a big focus of the book. This is all a new environment for Laura, but we don't get to see her explore this new environment. Uh, we don't get to see her reaction as she's going through a diving lesson. And th that doesn't have to be a huge moment, but it can be her exploring her options as, well, if I stay with Massimo, I'll get to do stuff like this all the time. It'll be great. She doesn't have a moment to collect her thoughts because she doesn't have any thoughts to collect. She is already set in this really simplistic archetype of she just likes rich stuff. That is literally the extent of her character, and that's why I think that she's so disappointing as a protagonist. And who's not disappointing is Leia. Come here. There you go. Did you have a nice nap under the bed? There's a, another typo I found in the book on page 154 when it says, I had the familiar accent. I don't know what this book was like in the original Polish, but in the English version, this is sloppy. This is... There are a lot of mistakes like this, especially for a professional book with, uh, what, several million copies out there? Demand more of your authors. Get angry when there are typos. In the next chapter, Massimo goes to some banquet meeting thing and he takes Laura along because I guess the plot needed him to. And she does some dancing. She dances with Massimo for a little bit. But, oh my God, drama as we run into Anna. Massimo's first and true love. And Massimo doesn't try to correct her and instead just tries to leave. Now, Anna was the girl from the beginning of the book that Massimo took his frustrations out on. And Massimo tries explaining himself and apparently Anna doesn't like Laura. As Massimo explains, she told me she'll kill you to take away the thing that I cherish the most, just as I have taken it away from her. Apparently, he left Anna the day Laura landed in Sicily. And Anna's apparently some sort of next level psycho. I followed you to that bookstore. How long have you been following me? Yeah, this is embarrassing. Uh, remember when you were on the cover of New York Magazine? That was like a year and a half ago. Yeah. Granted, Massimo could be lying about Anna and how intense she is as a person to cover for his past. It's not the first time he's told a bit of a whopper. This leads to some vulnerability from Massimo, which he desperately needed in order to have any depth in his character. And he hugs Laura and admits that he loves her. Laura turns around and confesses that she's never made love. She's only fucked. I fuck hard. We also get a timeline confirmation as Laura says that Massimo does not resemble the man who terrified her just a few weeks ago. Now, there's a moment where I had a bit of faith in the book. You see, up to this point, it's been passable. It's been okay. There's, a, there's plenty to criticize, but we're not on the disaster, uh, disastrous levels of what in God's name are you doing levels of bad writing like we've seen so many other times. Uh, up to this point, it looks like it tried to drum up a bit of controversy for the sake of publicity and then just kind of 
tapered off after that. It does get worse, I promise you that, but by this point, I've got a note that says, while this isn't as bad a book as I first thought, ignoring that it has one of the most disastrous intros I can recall of any book I've ever read, I can't really call it one of the worst books out there. While Lipinska gets a lot of story beats right, she takes a lot of lazy shortcuts. Lazy will forget Massimo murdering people, or that he's ransoming her family and threatening their lives as she tries to escape. Stockholm Syndrome does sit in for her in only a few weeks, and all of her apprehension for Massimo leaves for the sake of the plot advancing. No real good person would be able to endure what Laura does and act so kindly towards Massimo. He is a genuinely terrible person, and brief moments of vulnerability do not excuse the terrible things that we've seen him do, especially when he's in full control of his actions, not threatened by other people or powers or leaders or just can't blame his upbringing. At this point of the book, we get a few scenes of Massimo trying to express his vulnerability, trying to open up to Laura. And I think it's a good touch, just too little too late. It doesn't help that we get some pretty awkward lines out of it, though. You're heavy, I said, trying to slide from beneath him. And your cook, delicious cook, is perfection. Massimo burst out laughing and rolled over, freeing me. I'll take that as a compliment, baby girl. How else would you take that? His buttocks were beautifully toned, small and shapely. Mr. Hill, you have no ass. Now, as he's trying to express his vulnerability, Massimo takes an extra step and attempts to give Laura a tremendous gift. Actual freedom. Leia, you probably just ruined my shot. Would you like me to set you free? He asked, his eyes locking on me. I could see the tension in his face. I'm taking a great risk now, but I just can't really enjoy your presence when I know I'm making you unhappy. So if you'd like to leave, you can return to Warsaw. I can get you there today. I looked at him with disbelief, filled with joy. What <laughs> a small... Leia, stop it! When a wide smile appeared on my face, Massimo grew cold, and his stare became impassive. He said, Domenico will take you to the airport. The soonest flight leaves at 11.30. I am trying to read, young lady. Now, the next couple of chapters devolves into a trope that is weirdly common in romance stories for some reason that I like to call, if you idiots would talk for two minutes, all of this would get cleared up. Massimo takes Laura's momentary joy at the idea of being freed from kidnapping as a sign that she doesn't want to be with him, because that's normal, and he just leaves and abandons his cell phone and can't be contacted by her and just does whatever he can to occupy himself with business, because that's not an incredibly contrived way to advance the plot or try to enrich the drama. This isn't one of those moments where you see the love interest in the arms of an ex or something, and it's like, oh my god, he's going back to his old lover! And uh, there's, like, there's a brief misunderstanding out of that. This is like, you freed her from kidnapping. Why wouldn't she be happy? You were giving her something. You, did you expect her to frown, you dolt? But rather than go back home to Poland, Laura gets Domenico to take her to Sicily, and we get a change that I don't know why is in there, aside from just showing that Massimo likes to waste money, I guess. When we entered the driveway, I noticed it didn't look like last time. The maroon stones had been placed with dark gray ones, and the drive was lined with new bushes and flowers. General upkeep is good and stuff, but that just seems excessive. Like. Massimo spends money for the sake of spending money. And to a point, that's that's kind of the point of his character. He is insanely rich. He does insanely rich things, but you'd think he'd be a little smarter about it and spend his money well. But after spending several days waiting for Massimo in Sicily, she decides that, eh, well, this isn't working. She just wants to go back to, to, uh, to Poland. And while things are getting ready, she's watching the news, and it turns out the head of the Sicilian Mafia was shot in Naples. Oh my god, is Massimo going to be okay about halfway through the book in the first book of a trilogy? I don't know! It's so dangerous, he might be dead, guys! I think this is a very convincing plot point! The tension of whether or not Massimo survived 
lasts for about two pages as Domenico reveals that Massimo has a transmitter in his palm so that his associates uh, would be able to track him and locate him if he's ever in need of rescue. There's a chance he's alive. And this leads to something really, really dark. Don Massimo has a transmitter implanted into the inside of his left hand. A small chip, just like yours, he said, touching my left bicep. We know where he is at all times. For a moment, I got lost in thought, absently fingering the little tube in my arm. So what is this really? I asked, feeling the anger rising in me again. A contraceptive implant or a transmitter? What's inside me? No, there's got to be another way. What if we freeze him? What's in fucking inside me? Yep, the UTI that he had surgically implanted her on the first day of her kidnapping before they had had a real conversation was a GPS locator. I'm sure you're all terrified. And he lied to her about what it actually was. I... Mmm, the levels of invasiveness. Can we just admit that this has gone beyond power dynamic at this point? This is... I don't even know what this is. You're entering a world of pain, Walter. So, despite the fact that he thinks that Laura doesn't want to be with him, Massimo is still doing an awful lot to support her. For example, she has an account in the Virgin Islands that he set up, which we had no idea was a thing beforehand, but okay. Her flights back home were paid for, even though she doesn't react, because apparently her fear of flying vanished. Almost like the plot couldn't afford to have her have a panic attack at that particular moment. And Laura gets her own apartment and brand new SUV. When she gets a moment, she uh, contacts an old friend of hers, Olga. Uh, this is the first time she has been in the book, I believe. Olga is very jealous of Laura's accomplishments and everything that she has uh, gotten up to this point. And Laura tries to describe how she saw Massimo, and I'm not sure how reliable a depiction this is. He's, I began putting my glass down, special, commanding, haughty, tender, handsome, and very caring. Imagine your typical alpha male who can't suffer any disobedience and always knows what he wants. Then add in a protector and guardian with whom you always feel like a little girl. And finally, mix in the fulfillment of all your sexual fantasies. And that's if, uh, and if that's not enough, he's 6'3", has not an ounce of fat on him, and looks like a sculpture made by God himself. Small ass, huge shoulders, wide chest. That's Massimo, I concluded, shrugging. Hey, I heard you like bad boys. Yeah, why? Not to brag, but I'm literally bad at everything. Meet me at eight. Laura and Olga spend the day together. They just try to relax and go shopping, uh, buy shoes they don't need, stuff like that. And eventually she runs into uh, her friend Michael from the beginning of the book. And he says that Martin nearly dropped dead. He was so afraid for Laura when she disappeared. They thought she was kidnapped. Laura points out that she knows that Martin cheated on her on her birthday. You thought I didn't know? He fucked her on my birthday, the fuck? Well, it certainly illustrates the diversity of the word. <laughs> Oh, I forgot, Laura also got a credit card from Domenico that, uh, of course, Massimo is paying for. Moving on, Laura and Olga continue to go around and do shopping and make themselves feel good. One of the things they do is they just go to a, a full spa treatment, so they get peels, massages, facials, uh, nails, hairdresser, and makeup. And one of the things that Laura changes is her hair. She gets a cut a little short, uh, a bob with a, uh, the back shorter and the front a bit longer, uh, and she gets it dyed blonde. Now, it's not a big deal when something like that changes, like radical differences and trying something new can be really good. And sometimes it actually works out better than you might think. But why does Laura go for short blonde hair? It couldn't have to do with maybe the author has short blonde hair and wants to make this character more of a self-insert. I don't know, guys. That might be a bit conspiratorial. After that, Laura and Olga go to a club called The Ritual, where they used to eat, drink, and sometimes pick up guys. But of all the guys that were there, she just happened to run into Martin. 
all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. Martin wants to talk to Laura to try to clear things up and explain himself why he cheated on her birthday. And for some reason, they don't talk like in the club or outside the club. They go back to his apartment. And for some reason, his apartment reminds her of Massimo. And I couldn't tell you why. Martin tries to explain that uh, he went looking for Laura but couldn't find her and eventually found the uh, supposed letter that she had written but was actually written by one of Massimo's goons and he got depressed, uh, ordered a drink from room service and felt drunk after the first one. Hmm, that was odd. And then somehow cheated after that. And then their credit cards bounced and they had to leave like the day after. So the whole vacation was cursed. And after he started missing her, Martin realized how much he loved Laura and how he'll do anything to prove that he can change. Laura doesn't want to hear it. She just says that she wants to go home. Which makes me wonder, why was this scene set in his place when they've been there all of two minutes and had a conversation that could have been held out in the parking lot? Martin becomes one of those really creepy, uh, overly attached guys when he insists on driving Laura back to her new studio apartment and not only drops her off, but actually escorts her up to the right floor and to the door. And when she gets inside, doesn't allow her to close the door. I missed you, let me in, he said. The shooter sees her, she shot high on the chest, spins her around, spraying blood on the walls there. And there. But uh-oh, Massimo is actually inside, slowly approaches Martin and effectively tells him to leave. And so Martin leaves, but not for the last time. And Laura yells at Massimo saying, Do you have an idea, you goddamn egomaniac, what I've been through? There should not be so many typos in this book. We have what I would call a cute moment, if this was a good book, as Laura says that Massimo owes her 16 days, because that's how many days that they've been apart, which, in a vacuum, might be kind of adorable. In context, she is effectively saying, you need to kidnap me for another two weeks and two days. And there's another sex scene, and when Laura wakes up, there's blood all over the bed. And Massimo just tries to shake it off by saying his stitches must have broken. Anyway, they get to talking and Laura asks how long Massimo has been in Poland. And he says, since yesterday morning. Apparently he's been hanging out in her apartment ever since she left with Olga. Which does not help the stalker vibe this guy is giving off. Especially when he follows it up with this. How about yesterday? Did you send people to follow me? No, I followed you myself, Laura. I've been to all of those places, including your ex-boyfriend's apartment. I can tell you this. When you got into his car at the club, I was cl this close to shooting the guy dead. Which doesn't help the whole Laura is property angle that he is unintentionally building. She is not allowed to make her own choices or see her own friends. And despite Laura telling Martin to leave and having no apparent interest in ever seeing him again, Massimo uh, provides an ultimatum. Massimo's gaze was cold and deathly serious. Let's clear something up. Either you stop seeing him at all or I get rid of him. I knew negotiating wouldn't get me anywhere, but hundreds of hours of training on how to manipulate people didn't go to waste. I knew how to spin this. I think that what Laura's implying here is that she's gotten some sort of business class on how to make customers feel good or something like that. Which is weird, why would you spend hundreds of hours training for that? Unless her work in the hotel business counted as training, but that's... It's weird regardless. Laura's attempt to get Massimo to calm down about Martin is to kind of pit him against Martin as something of a rival. I'm just surprised you see him as a rival, I said impassively. I didn't think you'd be afraid of any competition. Especially after I saw those photos. He's definitely not of any interest to me. Envy is weakness. 
you only feel it when you know your rival's worthy. So, at least as good as you, or even better. I faced him and kissed him softly. I didn't think you had weaknesses. And he says, you know what, you're right, I can accept an argument if it's rational. And despite that logic, uh, and agreeing to that logic, Massimo is going to confront Martin again later on, you'll see. So apparently, he is afraid of Martin as a rival. Way to shoot yourself in the foot, Lipinska. Laura also confronts Massimo about what apparently he must have put in Martin's drink, because if for Martin to feel drunk after one drink, uh, it was is unusual. And Massimo doesn't exactly come clean. What counts is that he cheated on you. Not everyone feels the need to do that under the influence of what he got. It wasn't a roofie or MDMA. It was simply something that made the alcohol work faster. We only wanted him to get drunk quicker than normal. I won't lie to you. I had my hand in that. But he didn't go after you as soon as you ran away. I did slow him down, of course. But that, uh, but just think. How much would that have changed? Would you really like the whole situation to have played out differently? So, yeah, he did some terrible things, but hey, the ends justify the means, apparently. Now, keep that in mind, we're gonna be coming back to it, because it reveals one of Massimo's more hypocritical moments. Oh, but speaking of things that we've gotta come back to, do you remember the transmitter in Laura's arm? How it was never a UTI? Well, she decides to confront Massimo about that as well. I'll kill you, Massimo. I'm serious, I growled. How could you lie to me about something like that? I glared at him, waiting for him to say something smart in response, while my head was spinning with thoughts. What if? I'm sorry. I just thought that the easiest way to keep you with me would be if I got you pregnant. Massimo's a piece of shit. He lied to her. He put a transmitter in her arm, lied about what that was, did all that without any ounce of consent, attempted to knock her up intentionally, lied to her about the UTI in order to get her guard down so that she wouldn't take the morning after pill, and did all of that to get her pregnant so that she would be forced to stay with him. That is such a scummy thing to do. It is so manipulative. It is so evil of him. I just... Why does anyone like this book? Now, fortunately, unlike so many other things in the book, Laura does have a reaction to this particular moment. You've barged into my life, kidnapped me, stolen a year of my life, not actually true by this point, threatened to kill my loved ones, but it wasn't enough for you. You just had to try and fuck things up even worse by single-handedly deciding to get me pregnant. Now, Don Massimo, I'll tell you how it's going to be. My voice was loud and confident. If it turns out I'm pregnant, you will leave this place and I'll never be yours. The man in black rose, inhaling loudly. I'm not finished, I said quickly, turning my back on him and walking to the window. You'll see your child, but you'll never see me. The kid will never take over uh, after you and live in Sicily. Is that clear? I'll have it and raise it even though I don't want to. I always say that a family should be at least three people, two parents and a child. But I won't allow your behavior to destroy the life of a human being that is not even born yet. Do you understand? Keep that rant in mind. It's going to be important later. Now I can enjoy the occasional convoluted plot like Snatch or Noises Off, but this is extraneous for the sake of it. Lipinska let her characters loose and detailed a nonsense adventure with little to no framing or structure or even an overall plan, and this chapter is solid evidence of that. Absolute garbled mess of a book. Now, I can appreciate when an author is able to put a bunch of characters in a situation and just let them go loose and have all sorts of adventures and moments of drama and the like, but there's no story being told here. It's the same series of events where Laura and Massimo will bump heads, occasionally have sex, and bump heads back and forth ad nauseum. There's nothing being told. There's no growth happening. These two are very static, very toxic characters, and they're not going anywhere. One of my favorite movies that is a character-driven story is Finding Forrester, where you've got a reclusive author and a smart kid who doesn't really have the advantages he needs in order to really thrive in life. Well, the two meet and are able to work off each other to overcome their own problems. 
What are you doing? I'm writing. Like you'll be. When you start punching those keys. Is that a problem? No, I'm just thinking. No. <laughs> no thinking. That comes later. You know, they help each other, even though there isn't an apparent overall plan. The characters are able to meld in a way that uh, makes them useful to the other person. And they are enjoyable characters in their own right. So even if they don't have the other person, they can still stand up as people that we want to find out more about. Punch the keys, for God's sake! You can't say that about Laura or Massimo. They're very shallow. They're very selfish. They're not good people. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that in this review. Do not expect me to finish this trilogy. I don't think I have the patience for it. Massimo's wounds start bleeding again, so Laura insists on taking him to a doctor, and Massimo gives her a watch. Is this a transmitter too? I ask with a chuckle. No, that's just a watch, Laura. One transmitter is enough. You people are not normal! They go to a surgeon that Laura knows, and who uh, she has the favor of, and Massimo introduces himself as Massimo Torticelli. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Torticelli! Torricelli, I repeated silently. During those long weeks, I hadn't learned Massimo's last name. Uh, you must be the appearance of this uh, young lady. I'm sorry I didn't get her name, but uh, hopefully my son did. After that brief nothing of a scene that is really just there to write off Massimo's injuries, they go to dinner where they meet Carlo, a business associate of uh, Massimo's. This is what I'm talking about when I say that the book doesn't have an overall plan. Things will happen and those things will need an explanation like Massimo getting shot. So they go to a doctor in a brief nothing of a scene and then we're just supposed to expect that the, the entirety of the injury is just explained away from the rest of the book and is never going to really come up again. Uh, the creators of South Park had a good bit of writing advice. Uh, that they gave at one point where they say things in a story need to happen in some kind of a uh, sequential order. Uh, it's not that this thing happened and then this thing happened and then this thing happened. It's this happened, therefore this happened, which led to this thing happening. We can take these beats, which are basically the beats of your outline, and if the words and then belong between those beats, you're f***ed, basically. You got, you got something pretty boring. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. This is set up without consequence. It's not interesting to read about. We want things to have impact. We want moments to mean something. So don't just write it off with a hand wave. Anyway, it turns out that some of Carlos' people were the ones that actually drove Laura from the uh, airport to the new apartment. She has been under Massimo's protection this entire time. During the conversation with Carlo, Laura starts chatting with uh, Carlo's wife, and they're heading off a little bit. And at one point, th this is just random, but this is something that kind of bothered me. We get a line where Massimo doesn't speak, but smirked with self-assurance. Smirking is one of those lazy things writers can include often as an action during dialogue. It's like the theater stop. It's something amateurs do that sounds good, but is actually more common. They realize and reliance on it uh, displays one's limitations as an artist. Smirking now and then as a reaction is fine, but doing it a whole bunch makes it a crutch. And one of my least favorite acting things happens. I call it the, the tiffed half step. And I've seen a lot of new actors do this, uh, especially when I was doing theater back in like high school, college times. And basically it's when you try to show you're angry, and you want to be aggressive, so you do like this, like, ah, when you're trying to make a point, you don't actually go, ah, you're using your lines, but it's just to, like, get closer to the person. It's like, look how angry I am. It eventually stands out and becomes really distracting uh, for the reader. It's something that you've got to be aware of in your own writing and try to avoid or use other words when possible. Variety is the spice of life, as it were. Anyway, as Laura is talking to Carlo's wife, uh, Monica, Monica reveals a bit of the dangers of being married into the criminal underworld because uh, apparently she has been kidnapped before and this leads to one of Laura's more confusing inner thoughts. Her deathly serious tone terrified me. 
Would someone really want to kidnap me? Why? But someone had kidnapped her. It could happen to me, too. It did! That was the plot of the book! You... <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if Laura's supposed to have intense short-term memory problems. The only counter to that is she's just really, really stupid. So they go back to Laura's apartment where a whole bunch of flowers and a, a, uh, an envelope are waiting for Laura. It's from Martin where he asks, does he know what your favorite flowers are? Uh, does he know how you like your tea? Does he know your passions? Massimo doesn't like this display because he feels like Martin is disrespecting him. Laura tries to get him to calm down by saying, uh, haven't you ever fought for Omen? He has the right to try if he feels like it, and I have the right to make a decision. And then she has one of the most cold-hearted comments of the entire book. And I've already made it. I'm staying with you. Even if a whole orchestra is going to play me a serenade and he's going to sing, I won't change my mind. He's dead to me, just like that man you shot in the driveway. Jesus Christ, Laura! What the fuck is wrong with you? But this isn't enough to calm him down, and Massimo pulls out a gun and says that he's gonna kill Martin. All right, Bumblefox, it's time to move. <laughs> <laughs> Laura attempts to disarm the situation by pulling Massimo's phone away from him, and this doesn't go well. As calmly as I was able, I picked the phone from his hand and put it down on a cabinet next to the door. I took the key from the lock and put it down my panties, keeping my eyes on Massimo. With a burst of rage, he grabbed me by the throat and slammed me into the wall. That is not what love looks like. This one is compounded. Laura calmly takes Massimo's phone away from him despite Massimo being in a murderous rage. She then locks the phone in a cabinet, locks it, and then puts the key away. Despite how easily Laura took all that time, Masmo then grabs her by the throat, slams her against the wall, and roughly forces his hand down her pants. The juxtaposition makes no sense. If he was that angry, why did he let her casually take his phone away and lock it up? Also, assaulting her should send all sorts of red flags running through Laura's head. It won't. This is even the first time that he has been violent with her. She decides that the only way that she can get him to calm down is to offer to have sex with him, which is such a terrible message to send. Basic psychology here, what this does is reinforce bad behavior. That's why you don't want to try to reward catharsis. Rage rooms are a bad idea because you get pissed off and you get a dopamine release by breaking things. That reinforces the idea that breaking things is okay. Similar situation here. You're rewarding terrible behavior. Don't do that. I'll treat you like a whore. Do you understand me, Laura? And even if you change your mind, I won't stop. But remember, he won't make her do things that she doesn't want to do. And there's another sex scene, and with a little bit of build-up, they attempt some... Scary, but fun. So after some pretty weak pillow talk, Laura confesses that she also loves Massimo. And so Massimo pulls out a ring and asks Laura to marry him. There, that face that you're making right now, that is the appropriate response. Fuck if this isn't the most random-ass plot ever. But Laura's overtaken by how incredible the moment is, despite knowing this man for maybe two months. And she agrees to marry him for some reason. Probably because he's got a nice boat. We didn't make love that night, but it wasn't necessary. Closeness and love were all we needed. That and separate therapists. The next chapter starts with Laura waking up, take a shot, and she thinks about what life with Massimo would be, and we get a line that might as well have just been the initial inspiration for this entire book. One thing was for sure, this wouldn't be an ordinary, boring life. More like a gangster movie sprinkled with some porn. You, you're just lucky God isn't here. Part of the pillow talk involves Laura trying to convince Massimo that Martin means nothing to her, and he finally agrees to let it go with this. Massimo lifted his head and sent me an impassive look. Even now, even at a time like this, this goddamn piece of shit is between us. 
I'll only allow you to see him to get rid of that magnet once and for all. If you fail, we'll do it my way. I knew he was being serious. I had exactly one chance to save the life of my ex-boyfriend, or Massimo would take it. Thank you, darling, I said, kissing him softly. Absolutely psychotic. So because the entire relationship is dependent on how rich Massimo is, they do something else rich and ritzy that they haven't done yet, which is tour the, uh, the countryside in a Ferrari, which Massimo is turning into a sex game. Every couple dozen miles, I'll fuck you in the back seat, so I hope you like the car. He always turned me on when he was so commanding. I liked that he didn't ask my permission, instead just telling me what he'd do. Notices your c Rips it off. So they get back home and Laura has another bouquet of flowers with an envelope that says, I won't give up, written on it, from Martin. Massimo takes one glance at it, and then walks out, obviously with the intention of killing Martin. Laura tries to get Martin to run away, uh, to meet her somewhere so that he'll, he'll get away from Massimo before he can get killed. Uh, unfortunately, somehow Massimo instantly teleports over to Martin's apartment and Laura drives over there quickly in a panic. When Laura arrives, uh, there are a few goons and Massimo and Martin is sitting on a couch still alive and Laura quickly passes out. Then she wakes up. It really is that abrupt. There's no scene cut or anything. And it pisses off Massimo that Martin still has medication or some of Laura's medication in his apartment. Laura explains to Martin that it's over and he needs to stop and says that Massimo is going to be her husband. And Martin has a very unhinged rant. So that's what this was all about? You wanted to get married, and I didn't propose, so you found yourself some Italian gangster and now you're going to be his wife? You took your man on vacation only to find another one? That's fucking evil! Martin cheated on Laura, but doesn't seem to harbor any regret for his actions. It really contradicts how Laura painted him at the start of the book. Martin claims to be fighting for Laura, but considering that she told him it was over, this seems more like a possessive thing. He's like a shade away from stalking Laura as he doesn't seem to get the hint that, it, uh, that she doesn't want him around anymore. Also, all the goodwill that she had for him at the very beginning of the book has been completely evaporated. The good-natured guy who would give his money to, like, children's hospices because it's just good to share God's wealth or whatever his line actually was. None of that's around anymore. Martin's just this weird, possessive ex that can't let her go. It's weird because it doesn't mesh with who he was at the start. It doesn't work with how Laura herself described Martin. It sounds like his personality was changed arbitrarily at some point early in the book just for the sake of getting things to move along. Lipinska needed Laura to be with somebody for the sake of drama at this point, but didn't want her to be with someone like inconsolable or completely unreasonable because that's not the type of person that Laura was. She wouldn't be with someone who was a, an overly bad person, aside from the fact that she's with someone who's an overly bad person. She just needed Martin to be soft and clueless, which at this point he is, but Laura never described him as such beforehand. So he underwent a convenient off-screen transformation because the author was not talented enough to write him in a convincing, realistic way. Don't change your characters arbitrarily. Set them up and have them commit to those beliefs, goals, desires, personalities, whatever it might be that's driving them. If one of their central personality traits is that they would never abandon a friend in need and then they spent the entire book abandoning friends in need, it doesn't look like it's set up very well. It doesn't look like you actually put any real thought into their character or motivation. Laura gets upset at both Martin and Massimo, so she uh, storms out and goes to see Olga at her apartment, where Massimo eventually finds her as well. What are you doing here? I asked. And how did you find me? The car has GPS tracking in it in case it gets stolen. Well, you know, that and the GPS locator in her arm. You know what's weird? The book treats it like the GPS in her arm isn't a thing anymore, and I don't recall it ever getting removed. Masmo confesses that he did not kill Martin, and Laura says, In my eyes, he was the perfect man, an alpha male, a guardian and defender. 
I am so strong and masculine. My arm doesn't even shake when I'm holding a pot over the sink while I fill it up with water. You know, for the perfect man, these two spend a lot of time fighting each other. We get an exchange that I probably can't read out loud, but just remember that Massimo will never do anything that Laura doesn't want him to do. And during another sex scene, Laura slaps Massimo and has a fun time. She likes beating her man meat. I'm not proud of that one. Because I'm just gonna say it, I think it's super creepy you get sexually aroused by physical violence. Mm, well, but also emotional violence. Wow. Yeah! That's even creepier. Well, Laura's mother reminded her of a wedding that uh, she had to go to, family thing, and she goes to, you know, get dressed up, get made up, so she looks as presentable as possible. But of course, the question that comes up is, what is Laura going to tell her parents when she sees them again? Like, what is her relationship with Massimo? Because they've only known each other for two months, and now they're engaged. So it's maybe, maybe a little fast. Now, naturally, if Laura tried to invite her parents to a wedding that happened several months after this point, there would be a lot of questions like, what do you mean he kidnapped you? And what do you mean he threatened to have us murdered? Oh, but I don't think the parents are going to be able to make it to the wedding. You'll marry me next weekend, Laura. Not in a few months or years. In seven days. Seven days. <laughs> After a brief drive to Laura's parents, she gets to see her mother for the first time since her kidnapping, and her mom doesn't have a great reaction to Massimo. What's happening, Laura? She asked. You change jobs, apartments, how you look, and now you bring an Italian to my house? Like, I understand where Laura must have gotten this weird anti-Italian thing. I just don't know why. New Super Laura gives a tour of the house and they get to see the room that she grew up in, where he is very straightforward. They go over to the wedding where they meet Laura's brother, uh, Cuba. Cuba. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that. Cuba. And Laura gives a very strange introduction. He was my friend, my beloved brother, and an unparalleled ideal. He was also the smartest guy I knew, a true mathematical prodigy, and a real stud. When we used to live at our parents' house, he scored with all my friends. That does not sound like how one would normally describe a sibling, outside of the Lannisters. While they're at the wedding, uh, Laura also runs into another one of her exes, some guy named Peter? Piotr. I can't pronounce anything. Apologies to anyone actually named this. Apparently Piotr is a cokehead turned dance instructor. That actually makes sense. He dated Laura for a little while. Laura does not have any good memories of this man, but her parents never found out how bad he was and kind of pushed her into dancing with him at the wedding, which... Massimo doesn't like, but for the sake of family, doesn't murder him right then and there. Later on, Laura explains to her mother that Massimo is a bit jealous. He wasn't too happy seeing me dance with my ex. Remember, Laura, you can't allow him to act like he owns you. He has to understand you're not his property. Oh, how wrong she was. I was his property. Yeah, you go, girl. Now, keep in mind, Piotr used to do coke. Because of that, he was very mean to Laura. So it should be very impactful when Laura goes to see Massimo as he's hanging out with Laura's brother and there was a little pile of white powder in the middle of the glass counter and Massimo was arranging it into short lines. I froze, staring at the scene, when my brother appeared, holding a battle of shivas in his hand. And then Massimo put a finger to one of his nostrils and inhaled. You stay with me and we will do the, the manly bonding. Manly, manly bonding. bonding. Manly bonding. Hear me. Laura gets upset over Massimo's uh, imbibing and goes off to get herself a drink, as she often does, and runs into Peter. We sat there, talking about everything that had happened during all those years, about my life in Warsaw and his dance studio. One bottle of wine, then another, then a third. And the next chapter starts with her waking up with a bit of a hangover. And she remembers Massimo doing the white powder and talking to Piotr, and then nothing after that. Now, the way it had been set up, 
Piotr was a very dangerous individual who clearly had leftover desires for Laura. So the two of them drinking together uh, was sending all sorts of warning flares up in my head when I was reading it. Like he was clearly trying to do something. Fortunately, nothing happened. But Massimo found out about his attempt. For the sake of the video, I won't go into too much more detail. He was, um, Piotr was, may have slipped something into Laura's drink. Let's put it that way. I just assumed that he was just going to try to get her drunk and take advantage of her. But no, he actually slipped something into her, into her, uh, wine. Massimo stopped Pierre from, uh, his intentions, took him somewhere with, uh, with his men, uh, got Peter to confess to everything that he had attempted, and then Massimo killed him. In a way, I don't really have a problem with Peter getting killed like this. I really don't uh, think it's too much an exaggeration of Massimo's character or position to do something like this, to utilize his connections and abilities and cold-heartedness to get rid of a monster. There's really nothing wrong with that. Except for the brazen hypocrisy. Now, he's pissed off at Peter because he had drugs on him and I think he spiked your wine, but let's not forget that Massimo spiked Martin's drink early on the book in order to get Martin to cheat on Laura. Pot meat kettle. You cannot reasonably be upset at somebody for doing something horrible if you, in fact, do the same horrible thing. Sure, his intentions are different, but functionally, the act is the same. S don't spike people's drinks. That's a good position to hold, and one that Massimo doesn't fully believe in himself. Laura does want to get checked out to make sure that she's all right, so she goes to a doctor pretty much without really telling Massimo, even though she's got a GPS tracker in her arm. And the doctor can, uh, does conclude that there were intoxicants in her bloodstream. Ketamine, to be precise. Ahoy, SpongeBob! I've overdosed on ketamine, and I'm going to die! <laughs> and the doctor says this is very worrying, and he's going to have to order more tests and consult with a gynecologist, because why? You're pregnant, and we need to make sure the baby's okay. So, yup, Massimo's dishonesty has in fact led to Laura conceiving a child. And even though she said that she will never be with Massimo, if that's in fact what happened, she doesn't follow through with it. Baby needs a daddy. But Laura doesn't come clean about the, uh, the conception of the child, and just kind of drives off to escape the security detail which, you know, and, and just like sit on the side of the road for a little while because she needed to be alone. But of course, the car she stole from Massimo had a tracker as well. And between the baby and Massimo killing Laura's ex, she's feeling rather stressed out. You killed a man and it's my fault. Now I have a guilty conscience and I can't live like that. The only thing I want now is to get on a plane and never see you again. So either you do as I ask or this will be the last time you see me. Now, I like that Laura is reacting to this stuff. It gives impact to her character and the situation. It, her ex, uh, uh, Piotr, was, was killed, sort of because of what had happened. It's not like, clearly not her fault. Uh, Piotr was entirely responsible for his own actions, but she still feels guilty. She feels impacted by the situation, and that's good. It just doesn't go anywhere. It's momentary drama at best. It doesn't lead to any revelations later on. It doesn't lead to anything, period. It's just temporary drama. I disagree with her assessment, blaming the victim, but it does reveal character that she feels attached to the situation like this. This paragraph also reveals that Laura is too stressed from the new lifestyle, not sure how since she never complained about it before, but whatever, uh, and she wants to leave this life behind. This just reveals how dysfunctional this relationship is. Aside from the sex, what brings these two together? The money? There's no real chemistry that way, and everything is surface level. If there's no bond or connection between the characters, the romance doesn't feel believable. Laura eventually goes out to dinner where she runs into some guy who Frankly, I'm not sure why this scene is here. Mechanically, it doesn't do anything. It just helps her calm down. But it turns out Massimo's in the restaurant as well and eventually takes her back home, but not to the old place, to another new place, because 
We haven't spent a lot of money in the last couple of minutes. We might as well do that now. Massimo takes Laura to a new uh, place to live. Uh, this one is absolutely enormous. Apparently the bedroom reminds her of the bedroom of some great monarch. And of course, they have sex in it. At this point, you'd think that Massimo owns most of Europe. Before anyone says it, yes, I know that stuff like that happens in real life plenty of times, but it doesn't make for a good story. Now, something that I forgot to mention is that for a good portion of the book, uh, Laura has been getting randomly sick. Turns out that was all supposed to be morning sickness. And between that and the shocking doctor's visit that uh, resulted in her fleeing in a stolen car, stolen from Massimo, uh, Domenico has figured out that Laura is actually pregnant. He, of course, won't tell Massimo. He's good at keeping secrets. So Massimo still does not know that Laura is pregnant which she admits she hopes is a girl. She hopes it's a girl, not for any personal reasons, but because she, if it was a boy, it would probably be expected to take over the mob family business, which she does not want to have happen, even though Domenico explains that a girl can become the head of a family too, you know? Equal opportunity crime family. Now, Laura has a big day planned with Olga about going out and spending a lot of money. Massimo gave her a credit card and said, uh, spend it all. But before that, he left her another gift. I opened the box, revealing two smaller packages with the Givenchy logo on them. I took them out and opened them too. Both held the beautiful boots that Carlo's wife had had on when we met in the restaurant in Warsaw. I was in love with those shoes, but nobody in their right mind would have paid what they cost. I jumped up and down, squealing with joy. Both pairs were the same, only differing in color. I grabbed the boots, hugged them to my chest, and went to the closet, scanning all the glorious things on the hangers. And she runs into the closet, presumably to find an outfit that goes with the boots, which really doesn't help the image that Laura has as being a really shallow, materialistic alcoholic. Well, she and Olga go out on town. Uh, Laura eventually reveals that she's pregnant to Olga. Olga, being the good friend that she is, you know, offers condolences and tries to comfort Laura and lets her know that, you know, she'll be there for her bestie. Not a bad quality in Olga, really. Although Laura confesses that she thinks that she got pregnant from the first time that she and Massimo hooked up. Olga sits in silence at this idea and tries to reassure Laura that it's, it's okay. I don't want to sound like some crazy fortune teller, but you know these things don't happen very often, so maybe it's fate? Now, I know that I've been getting a little more sporadic and pointed with some of the criticisms as we've been going through the recap of this book, but part of that is because the longer we go through this book, the lazier, either the lazier the author got or the lazier the translator got because we were just going point to point to point with no real smooth transitions whatsoever. Everything is very direct. It is not comfortable to read. I don't like this. It's not a, a, flowing narrative. This is just, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Tedium, thy name is Lipinska. One of the more obvious examples that someone was getting lazy when writing this book is, if you want to check this for yourself, pages 302 and 303, because they go to a gynecologist for an appointment to check up on the baby to make sure everything's all right. They, and the doctor confirms that Laura is in fact pregnant by six weeks. However, as they're going in, uh, they, uh, Laura explains that she needed her friend's support as her fiancé had left. Later on that same page, Olga asks if it's safe for Laura to have sex. With my fiancé, of course. So which is it? Is the fiancé there or not? This is... This is very sloppy. Not even the fun kind of sloppy, like this book should be aiming for. Another example of the book being sloppily written. This is how it handles the conclusion of the doctor's appointment and then transitioning to the next scene. The man, the doctor, flashed a friendly smile and replied, none whatsoever, you can have as much sex as you want. Thank you very much, I said. I shook his hand and we left. High five, we're pregnant, Olga said with a grin as we drove to Taormina. It's so weirdly rushed, like things are said so quickly with no time to really set up or breathe. And there are ways that you can get around rushing things in the climax of a story. We don't have that much to go after all, but 
One, this is not climactic. Two, this isn't rushing things in a way that makes you excited or uh, hyped up in the moment. This is just getting things spewed out on page just so you don't have to establish them later. Laura says that she's glad that things went well and the appointment and that the baby is safe because, you know, the drugs from the, uh, the wedding party, well, those were bad. And Olga's like, you don't do drugs. And Laura tells her about uh, the story of the wedding party omitting the detail of Piotr's death. And Olga has the very normal response, what a prick. You know, even admitting the attempted one-sided consent moment, I don't feel like what a prick does the moment justice and not holy shit are you okay, just wow, that guy sure was a jerk. Laura also has the wedding to consider since it's less than a week away, so she needs to get a dress and Domenico takes her and Olga to a friend of his, a designer who has her own shop. And this is starting to get ridiculous. Like there are, there's no extent, uh, there's no end of Massimo's reach thanks to his access and money. And it's getting difficult to get into the story at this point because of it. Domenico just happens to know some fashion designer and has access to her workshop. So he takes Laura and Olga there for a consultation. Well, this isn't impossible. It does serve the nigh infinite access and money baseline that Massimo and his business holds. Money and professional access aren't an object, so without personal drama, this story doesn't have any real boundaries or stakes. The only boundaries are the limitations of reality, which makes this personal fantasy story seem like it's only a single person's very specific personal fantasy story. It raises the question, why must this story be told? The fashion designer is a uh, special friend of Domenico's, a woman named Emmy who is tall, slim, and incredibly beautiful. Her long, straight black hair fringed her thin face, and I hate that I know this is wrong. She had unnaturally large lips and enormous eyes like a Japanese manga doll. I believe you mean Hime doll. I blame me watching clips of my dress-up darling that I know that. And then the book just throws so many details at us that it becomes very difficult to get invested. So many things get thrown out on this one page that I just don't care. I want this book to be done. Emmy asks what kind of material or shape that Laura would want for her dress, and Domenico says, Surprise us, my love, Domenico said, slapping Emmy on the butt. My jaw dropped. I had been sure he was gay until now. Wait a minute, I said, raising my arms, while all three of pairs of eyes turned to me. Explain something to me. I'm lost. Who are all of you to each other? Emmy and Domenico burst out laughing, and the woman wrapped an arm around my young assistant. We're friends, she said, smiling. Our families have known each other for years. Massimo and Domenico's father was best friends with my dad since primary school. I even had a crush on Massimo back in the day, but he wasn't interested. So I allowed the younger brother to take his place. She planted a kiss on Domenico's cheek. If you need specifics, yes, we slept together. A bit less often since you've arrived, but we manage, she said, uh, winking at me. Want to know anything more, or shall we pick you a dress? I don't fuck Massimo, if that was your next question. I prefer my men younger. This is just gushing out at a character's entire backstory just for the sake of doing it. Look, if you can't get something to fit in naturally, you shouldn't feel obligated to include it. Sometimes you just gotta leave bits of information behind because that's what best serves the book overall. If your world's rich enough and you have enough material that you can't fit in, you might be able to come up with like a book of trivia or factoids that fans could devour later on. I'm not sure how many people would actually be interested in a book of factoids on this series, but it's possible you'd probably make a few sales at least. Well. Emmy happens to be a very good designer who has a few dresses laying around that she might be able to modify a little bit. And after one single guess and 10 minutes of adjustments, Laura has her wedding dress. It wasn't pure white, but slightly delicately peach colored. The dress featured a bare back and was covered with thin lace. It was tight fitting from the waist up, while the lower part was flowery and loose with a very long train, at least six feet long. The perfect V-necked, V-shaped neckline went perfectly with my small breasts, allowing me to wear no bra. There was delicate crystal embroidery beneath the breasts, perfectly complementing the gown with its gentle glimmer. 
It was perfect. Ideal. I knew Massimo would love it. I, I've heard that it sometimes takes hours to get the right dress. The fact that she got it right in one just tells me that the author wanted to get this scene done with. There's no exploration. There's no... There's not even a, a brief description of, oh, we spent hours looking at different dresses until we found the right one. The entire outing to get Laura a wedding dress was remarkably easy. Kind of disappointingly so. This is similar in writing style to Twilight, in which very little really happens or goes wrong. No conflict means no story. This is a lengthy, ill-defined personal fantasy that got popular for no discernible reason. You guys know that good porn isn't that hard to find, right? Olga is going to be Laura's maid of honor, so of course she needs a nice dress as well. And hey, they're in Emmy's studio, so they might as well see if there's anything available. So while they're eating together, Olga raises the question of, What about me? Olga asked. With all those things we bought me, there, isn't, there still isn't a single thing that would match your dress. Emmy put down her fork, chewing a piece of octopus, and went to one of the hangers. I can see the hooker style is something you're familiar with. That was... just rude. I'm not even sure why. There doesn't seem to be any an uh, animosity between Olga and Emmy up to this point. Now, because this book seems to think that it's run entirely on very hollow drama, uh, the next page, Laura gets upset with Domenico uh, about the security detail that always has to follow them around. You're impossible, Domenico, I cried, pushing him through the door. I'm nearly 30, and I've always coped without a band of armed men. I'll be all right, so quit being so overprotective. This, of course, is counter to the advice that she got from Monica, the uh, wife of the other gangster that warned Laura about being kidnapped. Laura is very smart. Laura lashes out at Dom in a moment of arbitrary drama. She doesn't want him or the security detail to follow her around, though we don't really know why she's troubled by this. She even promised Massimo that she wouldn't try to outrun them again. Massimo got shot, and he's warned her numerous times about potential danger. This is the protagonist going out of her way to be stupid just so something could happen. This moment, among many, is the textbook definition of an idiot plot. Idiot plot is one which can only happen if the characters are idiots. Laura opens up to Olga later on and says that she's really worried about what life would be like once she actually has the baby. Laura worries that everything is going to change. She'll have a child, a husband, the whole package, and all that in only the span of about two months. Olga says she's overreacting. You can hire a nanny. Who will, le uh, who will she leave the kid with when she goes to a ball or some formal dinner? She better start thinking about that already. And Laura reacts in a way that doesn't mesh with her character. Why would I? I asked, shrugging. I know he'll decide for me. I won't have a say in anything. It'll be about his child's safety. I shook my head, suddenly afraid. Jesus, he'll lose it. He'll be too scared to leave us for even a minute. Even though earlier she said that she liked how protective and controlling Massimo was. What is driving her to this man at this point? Aside from the sex and money, they don't have a bloody thing in common. This is a very doomed, shallow relationship. And the book is not aware of that. It is not even marginally aware of how destructive these two are together. Unfortunately, Laura's inattentiveness puts her and Olga in a bit of a bind the next day, or some days later on. Honestly, I... Just I'm just kind of breezing through it at this point, because the book is... They go out shopping again, just hitting the town, and drive off with the security detail behind them at some point, when all of a sudden, the uh, SUV that the security detail is driving crashes into them and starts trying to run them off the road. Laura calls Domenico and asks what the hell is going on, and he says, that's not your security detail. Oh my god! The car is bulletproof, so as long as they stay inside, they'll be all right. Uh, there is a brief car chase as Laura gets, you know, drives her way to a security checkpoint that Domenico meets her at. Uh, Laura and Olga are okay. They just got a little scared by the uh, by the entire experience. And Domenico promises that they'll find the the men that uh, chased them down, and Laura asks him not to kill them. Okay, I guess that she just doesn't like death, except for when she doesn't react to or care about death. Whatever. But this entire event was such a shock to the system that Massimo thinks that it might be a good idea for Laura to leave, to call off the wedding, and, and 
split away because he doesn't want to put her in any real danger. What are you saying, Massimo? I cried, jumping to my feet. Now you want to send me away? Two days before we're supposed to get married? He spun around, shooting out his arms and grabbing me tightly by the shoulders. Do you even want that? Maybe I really should be alone, Laura. I chose this life. I didn't give you a choice. I am condemning you to be with me, to be in constant danger. He let me go and started walking towards the stairs. It was stupid of me to think it could end any other way, that we could be together. He paused and turned his head toward me. You deserve someone better, baby girl. I can't believe it, I cried out, running to catch up with him. Now you start thinking about me? After two months? After proposing to me? When I'm about to have your child? And that's it. That's the end of the book. I, I love a good cliffhanger. I love it when a book can end on a really dark or suspenseful note. It gets you really charged up. You, you want to jump into the next book. This feels like a conversation just got cut off mid-sentence. It doesn't leave me wanting to find out how Massimo reacts, because I don't find him appealing as a character. It doesn't leave me wanting to find out what happens to Laura. Is she going to be okay? Are they going to stay together? There's another two books in this. I wonder what's going to happen. This absolutely falls flat. It's... It's just tedious, and I am glad that this is done. This is a dreadful book. Now, I told plenty of dumb jokes about this thing, but this is... Look, we, we've all made complaints about the relationship in Twilight or in uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. We didn't know how good we had it with Christian Grey. The relationship depicted in this book is so horrible, so incredibly toxic. I mean, Edward Cullen is a boring ass, slice of white toast, 100 year old virginal stalker boy. But at least he actually cares about Bella and gives, like, tries to ask some input from her. You guys know the blank is still a better love story than Twilight? Well, Twilight's a better love story than this. Wrap your head around that one. I get that Massimo is supposed to be this really powerful, um, whatever, semi-evil mafia guy, but could we at least have some good qualities about him? Does he have to be, like almost completely evil. The the few good things that we could say about him, uh, like those brief moments of nobility, are what the rest of us would call normal behavior. It doesn't stand out as some sort of a prime example of why he's good. It's expected. Like, that's, that's the minimum you should be trying to attain. The whole wealthy angle and spoiling Laura doesn't make him a good person. It doesn't make him anything, really. It just means he's rich by, and by itself. That doesn't tell you anything about him. Laura, likewise, is almost impressively shallow. She's like an unironic valley girl who's just into, like, shoes and boys and looking pretty and doesn't realize how narcissistic she comes across to the point where she is actually squealing for joy over a pair of expensive shoes her go-to activity is either drinking or shopping and the details that we get in those scenes aren't terribly revealing the most character that we got out of any of those scenes was when she went and got her hair cut she has a definite over-reliance on alcohol that the book is does not ever really call to any attention. She has very self-destructive behavior that she seems to do just to piss off Massimo. This is a train wreck of a character, but the book doesn't treat her like a train wreck. Lipinska seems to treat Laura like this is somehow acceptable or some kind of normal. The side characters are passable at best. Domenico was fine. Olga was fine. Some of the other, like Marco, if you can actually recall him, uh, was fine. But at the same time, they don't really have a lot of definition. Olga was probably the best character out of this book, but she's almost as shallow and materialistic as Laura was. The pacing, the writing style was such a mess. Look, I get that this is an erotica, uh, but there are so many things thrown in there 
at the cost of an erotic narrative. There are entire scenes that are detailed that don't need to be. There are scenes that we should really expand upon, but are just glanced over without a second thought. And while the book did do a better job of setting up the erotic moments uh, better than the mister, a lot of the surrounding details are very uncomfortable or very distracting. In a well-written erotica, you would enjoy at least, hopefully, some of the characters, and you would enjoy the erotic moments when they finally happened, which would leave you looking forward to when they happened again. So when you got some inkling of sexual tension building up, you'd be thinking, oh boy, we're getting another awesome scene. You don't get that in this book. You get this weird moment of, oh God, what are they gonna do now? Seriously, I, a much better example, Sunstone. Just check this series out, it's, it is worth it. But I could forgive that if the writing style wasn't such trash. And again, I don't know who to blame for this, if it's either the original author's fault, or if it's the English translator who just got really lazy. So many scenes are so disjointed and just rushed so badly. By the end of the book, it felt like the translator was rushing to finish everything up as quickly as I was. Absolutely amateur all the way around. Laura and Massimo don't work because the book doesn't work as a romance. As an erotica, it's fine, but the book seems to think that it's something more than the smut that it is. It's a fantasy, but a senseless one. The individual elements of the erotica work well enough when considered in a vacuum, but the overall story crumbles. It's like trying to make an obelisk out of black tar heroin. It's just going to collapse and won't hold shape. This has been one of the most bizarre, toxic, vile books that I have ever read. Massimo has no redeeming qualities, and what little growth he shows are stop gaps before he falls back on old habits. Laura has a few moments of independence, but she's mostly a wilting flower who just does what the plot needs her to do or feel. There was no plot, just an endless series of events that went from one point to another, allowing for some exploration of the characters, but little change. The characters and story were less important than detailing how rich uh, Massimo was or how great Laura's life was now. The sex scenes were fine at best. I've read plenty that were much better. But you can easily get better scenes for free online, which have the benefit of not forcing you to sit through this tepid, real housewives bullshit. Worst of all is that these characters depict the worst kinds of people, the worst kinds of men, the worst kinds of women, and no one should see these as aspirational or icons or of any sort. They are, uh, they are all vicious, selfish scumbags, and the book's only point of merit is to remind the world that uh, Christian Grey could have been much worse. Zero out of ten, use this for target practice. Sorry for the sudden change. Uh, there has been a, an update in how I wanted to do this. So, uh, originally I had four books that I wanted you guys to choose from because I've got so many awful books to read. How am I supposed to pick? I was able to narrow it down to four. Uh, we've got uh, Save the Pearls, Revealing Eden, that James Toulos recently reviewed and called Racist Hunger Games. Uh, we've got the watered-down culmination of every single romance trope ever with After by Anna Todd. We have Jenna Moresi's The Savior's Champion. She's another YouTuber who does uh, book advice things, so she should probably know what she's talking about. And originally, the choice that I was going to go for was, uh, or one of the options that I had was uh, Marked by PC Cast, but uh, Blitz Campire on Twitter recently told me about this little mess. The World Rose by Richard Britton, who actually did time for attacking someone who gave him a bad review for this overly flowery nonsense fairy tale book. So there are your four options. There will be a poll on Twitter for the next three days uh, once this video goes uh, public that uh, you'll be able to vote on to decide my fate, to see what I drive myself mad with next. I would say be merciful, and plenty of comments do want me to go out and read good books, but uh, that's not as much fun, so do your worst. Demolition Ranch. Today we're gonna find out 
Will a boyfriend stop a 50 cal? Wait, what? <laughs>